session. It's 207 p.m. on Tuesday, October 3rd, and it's here in the City Center Conference Room. This meeting is being broadcast live on YouTube, Hill City Council, where it will also be available for on demand viewing. Please be aware that the microphones to the room pick up the noise of paper and other rest of the objects. Further, be aware that the microphone can pick up side conversations. And I'd like to begin with a uh, roll call. Cliff Strachan, Brian Jones, mm -hmm. David Hardy, Kim Santiago, Gary Winterton, Elizabeth Vanderton, Dave Sewell, Dave Knack, Bryce Welford, Luke Stewart, Kay Van Buren, Wayne Parker. Thank you. The opening prayer will be provided by Jimmy McKnight. Father in heaven, we're grateful to be present at this meeting of the Municipal Council. Grateful for all that we have and this beautiful place we have to live. We ask you to bless this body as they deliberate that they can make wise choices. And we ask you to bless those who have been impacted by the tragedy in Las Vegas. And we ask for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Looks like we have one set of minutes to consider today, uh, and that is for the November 17, 2016 parking retreat. Let's get those back in place. Um, any concerns or uh, items that need to be addressed with those minutes? It was an interesting 14 page read. <laughs> In some ways, it was actually helpful to review some of the topics that we discussed. So, yeah. okay, well, if there's no concerns about the minutes, uh, I'll take that on approved by unanimous consent. Thank you. Now, before we proceed with the agenda, I'd like to remind those in attendance that although this is a public meeting, only good presenters and those seated at the council table may speak or ask questions, and otherwise, unless otherwise allowed by the chair. Thank you. Let's move on to item number one, which is a discussion on proposed code revisions for the sanitation department. And this is to be presented by Mr. Decker from the public works director. I'm going to take, um, we actually have two parts of this presentation, um, if that's okay, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, we appreciate the opportunity to, to meet with the, uh, the council. We were actually originally asked to come back and, and discuss the first topic, which is um, a final recommendation on sanitation fees, and then we also um, have some minor modifications on that point. But uh, just really quickly, um, on the original um, intent or original request that came from council staff, we had been asked uh, to, to come back and um, if, if you remember, the council had uh, done uh, kind of a, a temporary adoption of sanitation fees with the idea that we were going to come back and do some additional presentations or final recommendation. And this is a table that is out of the previous presentation. If you remember, we had, we had come up with, um, I think we started originally with four options and, and eventually some of the options fell out. A couple of them were um, added. Option five was uh, one that we uh, took from an email from Dave Harding, Councilman Member Harding, and, and option six kind of morphed out of the conversation with the council. But um, if you recall, we had done a tentative adoption of uh, uh, this option right here, this, this uh, current option. And the council staff asked us to come back and uh, today and at this point, um, just given the timing uh, where we're at and the, the fact that we have a budget uh, preparation cycle that starts in January, we're recommending that we just stick with the, with the fees that the council has adopted at this point through the rest of the fiscal year. We're not making any recommendations for changes at this point. Part of the reason um, we have um, anticipated um, a discussion about a tiered water rate, and um, we briefly mentioned that to the council a couple of different times. And from a timing standpoint, 
um, uh, with the Provo 360 project, which is going into the second phase uh, that modifies our billing uh, software, uh, we're recommending that that tiered rate start with the with uh, when we go into the new uh, software, the billing software, and we're going to probably take the same approach with the council on, on uh, sanitation rates if we want to have a conversation about combining, you know, into one rate uh, with the way we had. Uh, uh, discuss Salt Lake City does that. Um, we probably think at this point that it makes sense to do that when we convert to the new building software and just make all those changes at the same time. Right now, the schedule for that is um, potentially in December. We've had some questions about whether that's um, still going to happen next December. That's I should clarify that's not December of 17, that's December of 18. So that's still a year and several months away. Um, but that's that's our recommendation right now as far as the sanitation rate. So we're just at this point. I think we need to go through the rest of the fis fiscal year where we're at. So any questions on that? So Dave, which what would that be? That current? Yes. We just stick. This is this is what was adopted several months ago by the council, and we're recommending that we just stay with that. Current. When you point, you don't point to that last twenty-five dollar. You point to the whole column. We're right? talking. We're talking that whole column. Yes. So somebody that has a black can right now, they're getting charged sixteen dollars, and we just just stick with it. So if I have a black and green, I'm going to pay twenty-one dollars. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. If you have a black and a green, your black can goes to fourteen dollars, and then and then you're charged for the green can, so it's nineteen. Any concerns or questions? I wonder if you should just maybe just spell that out because you've got black with blue and green, but then you've got black and blue. So if you just went black and green, you'd have the 19. Your final list. And we can do that. This is, this is currently what our customer service billing people are doing. Um, that, that column is representative of what we've adopted right now. So. Concerns? Should we move on to the next topic? I just have a question. I'll tell me about the requirement. Every resident has to have a black can. So that's what that, is that? What does that? What does that mean? That's kind of the topic that Brian's going to cover. And uh, we had been reviewing partly because of, of of the fees, but for other reasons, we had been going through the code. And um, uh, Bryce, I think, was actually one. Uh, Bryce or Jimmy, who by the way are sitting in the back here, um, one of the two of them pointed out. Um, our current code um, is a little bit um, uh, in, in a gray area whether we really require every single resident to have a black can. And um, my initial first reading, I thought it was covered, but it's legal and some of the other people started looking through it. They, they suggested a couple of uh, modifications to our current ordinance. And that's what Brian's going to cover today. Okay. If we're ready, I'm not sure where our screen went. So as Dave mentioned, I think at staff level, our understanding of the what we thought was in code was that it was in fact required of every resident to have a, a, a minimum of one black can, um, and then obviously they can choose whatever they wish to do with, with recycling or green waste. Um, so a little background, there was a gentleman who happened to be an attorney, um, started pushing back on this a little bit, wanted to be, he owned two residences right next to each other, felt like they didn't need two cans, and, um, and so Bryce, doing what he, he does so well, um, pushed back a little bit on what we felt like was in code, and, and uh, again, this gentleman pushed a little more and, and so we had our legal department review the, the actual ordinance and and uh, so this was the question that was posed to our legal our, our legal team and, and uh, their answer is that probably not uh, right now in our in our current code would it be required to have a black can um, and so that's what David mentioned it's a little bit gray so 
the the intent of this proposed um, text amendment would be to clarify that to indeed require everyone to have a black can um, and there's some there's still some some back and forth with with mr jones and bob tromley on how how to word that best but we we want to get this before you and, and uh, start the dialogue a little bit um, so basically uh the gist of the proposed amendment is to establish a minimum requirement for um, residential sanitation services um, it explains when and where refuse collection service is required and, and it also establishes a minimum amount required which um, right now we're we're saying that's 95 gallons per residential unit um, which does a couple of things it, it basically sets the minimum amount that every residence have a, a black can 95 gallons is the size of our cans um, but it also in a multi-family setting um, ensures that we don't have um, overfilling of dumpsters and those sorts of things so that 95 gallons uh, per unit is uh, we feel is a pretty good uh, again it does two things it that's the size of our can which which is kind of a double-edged sword requires everyone to have a black can and then sets those minimum standards for multifamily. So the uh, dumpsters are done in yards mm -hmm. and so you have to translate that? It's essentially one half a 100, 100 gallons is a half a yard. So 95 gallons standards are so the intent moving forward is when we when our team is doing development review and reviewing sanitation we our sanitation group has always had a slot to sign off on development review however there's never really been a whole lot to look at other than can the garbage truck get in to service the dumpster um, this provides actually some direction to our development review folks to say you know this you don't have enough there you've got you're over servicing your your unit so um, again some wordsmithing that that we need to work out between between us and uh, just want to get council's thoughts feelings and, and any input at this point as we move forward so in the multi-unit do you think they would create that much trash as much trash as a single family unit would and would it be um, wise to look into most units to see if, if that can be lessened or is a dumpster standard size and that's going to meet the requirement of pretty much whatever you know okay. what i mean i, I so know a different size for dumpster, those but... technical questions i'm going to turn to bryce so bryce can you can you answer that question um, right now there's there's no plan to go back and say hey look you're underserviced or you're underserviced what it does allow us is when we do get a complaint about service levels about there's lots of trash on the ground right now we can't force them to upsize because there's there's no recourse on that <laughs> so what it does is it gives us a, a tool to say look if you're constantly having trash lying on the ground outside the dumpster then we need to look at the size of the unit that you have and this gives us a minimum amount to to start with so that we do have some uh, enforcement capabilities there's that's that's why it went from just the one black can talking about the black can at the single family homes to actually the 95 gallon for uh for the, the dwelling units as, as a tool but we, we've actually had some discussions lately with a couple of properties that have a habitual nature of having trash left on the ground where we're constantly out there calling ace and republic and waste management and, but there's nothing that we can do, uh, you know, code-wise to, to enforce that. Uh, mostly multi-unit? That's, well, that's more, more, yeah. more. Generally speaking, the, the uh, apartment complexes, if they're at that 95 gallon, they, they don't have problems. If they're under that, they, they usually have a problem. Even, in the uh, the more um, student housing sections because they tend to have more per you know they have roommates and stuff like that and they have a, 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 a 
here. Is there any flexibility to where a a right? What things are made? But I've got a commercial dumpster, and around that I have residential housing that I own also, and the city has had the opportunity to say, okay, as long as you're using the dumpster and paying for that, we I don't need five cans. And is there some kind, can we go to somebody and say, is there an opportunity for an appeal to say, this, I will, I want to take care of my garbage. So I think what you're asking, Gary, is curbside is, you can choose it, unless I'm wrong, Dave or Bryce speak up. But if you're an owner of, of five apartments and it's all in one building, there's nothing that says you have to have curbside service. But if you do have curbside ser service, then the city's picking it up. But you can contract with a commercial hauler, and that's and that's kind of covered in here, unless you've contracted with a commercial hauler to pick up that waste, you are required to have a black can. It's actually so, spelled out in number two. If you read the yeah, second sorry. sentence, it says, alternate uh, refuse collection method, including dumpster and or roll off services for multi-unit structures shall be arranged by the property owner. So we're not- and that, So that gives us the opportunity to not have to deal with the cans, be charged for a can that we're not gonna use anyway. Correct, so that, if you look through the wording, at least I'm having a hard time picking it out right here to put on the spot, but, but the wording is if, unless sewer and water have been terminated correctly and an owner has contracted with a commercial hauler to pick up waste otherwise we would expect you to have a black can and so in your case gary where you contracted with a commercial hauler you wouldn't be required to have a black can because you have contracted with the commercial hauler okay so and that language is not changing other than the and or in that sentence that's always been in the code that's always been an option for multifamily property owners. So that that is not yeah, that's not changing at it's all. Only one it's actually right here. Required to have a black cat with the single family houses. Right. That they, makes sense. They, they would be required to have a black can and not a dumpster because the dumpsters are multifamily. So just just a little bit more on the background of how we got here. So this same gentleman that was pushing back, he, he informed us he would be going around and notifying HOAs that that are there may be um, what condominium type where they have a black can curbside service uh, he said I'm gonna go let them know that they don't all have to have a black can and they can share and that's that's kind of why we anyway a little more in the background of what prompted us to maybe tighten this up just a little bit so um, just the way I read that as long as Mr. Winterton is you know has a dumpster that can provide 95 gallons of refuse right. per unit per week, then then it'd be good under what's proposed. Um, the, the other thought we, we talked a little bit about you know looking at Salt Lake on that previous slide. I do know uh, in Salt Lake they do offer a garbage can that's less than 95 gallons, um, and I think one of the reasons is um, is if you recycle. All of you know your household stuff and your and your green waste. Um, it's very possible that you don't need 95 gallons of of you know, a black can basically, and so and so I, you know, I'm, I'm a little. That's that's just something something I think we should we should consider is, is perhaps, and that and I was interested. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, that the, the places that are having problems with garbage being left on the ground, that they're under the 95. So, you know, if, if we if we found those and found, you know, that there may be only a 50 or something, that, you know, maybe 80 is sufficient or, or whatever, that, that might be interesting to look at. Um, anyway, yeah, it just, uh, so it seems like the 95s may be a little, a little rigid. You know, we picked it because that's the size of our cans. So, and I guess this is a policy that, that we'll have to discuss, but let me just offer my thoughts on on different size cans. Um, you look at the how many different rates we have and the complexities of billing that, then add two different size cans of that, you're you're doubling or tripling the amounts of options and things that need to be put in a billing system and kept straight. And anyway, so there's some logistics to that. And then you look at the cost side of it, it's 
the cost is the same. We're, we're picking up the can, trash is what it is, whether it's out of a 95 gallon container or a 65 or whatever it be. So the costs are really the same. And if you look at it from that perspective, do we really want to charge less if, if the cost is the same? And so what, what does the city really benefit from going to different size cans other than creating a lot more complexities in the billing and, and all of that sort of thing. So anyway, that's that's just to consider. So, can it seem like we reduced the cost by going to the same standard size can and just changing the lid color. Did we reduce the cost pretty significantly by doing that? Yeah, from an inventory standpoint, and Brian hasn't mentioned this, but from an inventory standpoint, it simplifies our inventory significantly because we, if we're using the same can, the only thing that we're storing additional inventory is uh, is the lid and the color of the lid. So we can actually store less cans. We can have less on hand, um, and, it, and it actually reduces our inventory. It also reduces the cost of trucks, too, because then we have to put the groups Selecting mechanisms on the trucks. I just, I want to, I apologize, I guess, uh, for, for bringing it up the way that I did. I just meant to, to indicate that there's another city that has found, particularly when coupled with recycling, that 95 is more than necessary for some residences. And so speaking solely, not of this, but speaking solely of kind of the dumps, dumpster size okay. requirements, perhaps if, if a multi-unit place is offering recycling, the 95 is, is more than would actually be necessary, would actually almost create a disincentive to recycle, whereas, sure. you know, if they were offering both services, then they wouldn't need to spend as much on, on the garbage side of it. And I think to get a handle on something like that, we'd really have to take that, which, which we're happy to do if that's the way we want to go. We'd have to get some, try and figure out some, some way to study, you know, I, I don't know. We can we can take a look at that and see if there is some reduction in, in the amount needed in the in the dumpster size if there is a recycling dumpster there. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. So I, I deal with dumpsters at churches and wherever. Um, I I kind of like where we are. And if some families or some buildings use a little bit less than the 95, uh, on, on an average, you have to think about what uh, what happens when there's an above average event, whether it's Christmas or something else. So having a little extra room for those unusual things that come along is nice. Sure. And as a landowner, I just would not want, I'm getting that garbage out of there as fast as I can on those special days. People throw it all the time right by the dumpster. If it gets full, but I'm not going to let that stay. I don't care who puts it there. I'm going to find out who did it, and then I'm going to chew them out, but I'm not going to let it stay there. Unfortunately, it's not generally the, the landlords that have two or three or four units. It's the, the it's ones the that neighbors by, and the Well, it's the ones that... This, the properties that are run by a uh, by uh, a, a management company. So, thank you. And that's that's what we're having an issue. I understand. Is the, the the large management companies that possibly don't have somebody there at the time. Any other <laughs> questions? I think we just need a an indication that we're headed in the right direction and, and that we can tighten the wording up with, with the attorneys and, and make sure we're on the right path here. Back to Gary's example, if you had a, and I don't know if you do in this area, a single family resident, like a little house, the one split to duplex, one's a single family, one's that wording makes a single family resident have a black can, right? And, and I've got that situation, and they still use the dumpster, but I'm, I'm okay with them having a, a black can also, personally. Um, That's but probably the only... It's, it's tricky, but as a single-family resident, we all produce garbage, and I think they ought to have a black can, too. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
even though I have, I have, even though I have a dumpster that's just as close as the black can. So if you have a duplex, that's pretty clear. You need two cans. But what if you have an accessory apartment? Is that being just one dwelling with an accessory in one can? This is where I would turn to the attorneys. Um, I believe the way the ordinance is written that any, and I'm not even sure the correct terminology, but but any separate, what's the, what's the terminology? Um, well, so separate was, housekeeping would be considered one dwelling unit. And so, look for dual electrical hookups or water meters or whatever to determine. You know, that's when, my guys, when, when we get a call or a request for another cab, one of the things that we'll look for is how many electrical hookups are there and determine, okay, at least that's the way we were doing it under the assumption that every resident needed a, you know, prior to finding out that there was a, a, a you know, some wording issues, but we, that's what we would do is we would look for how many electrical hookups in there that require that in the county. And that's what our standard, our standard process for approximately. As I was going through this, at least, and again, this may be part of the wordsmithing that we need to clarify. If you had a single family home with a, or a duplex, what was the situation? Du duplex is clear. It's a single family home with an accessory apartment. Okay. In my course. mind, that would be two housekeepings or, or whatever the terminology mm -hmm. is and would require two black cans. We'll have to take a look at that. What we've done in the ordinance is, is just simply referred to the definition of a dwelling in the zoning code. And um, it says dwelling means a building or portion thereof designed and used for residential occupancy. But then there's a specific definition for dwelling one family with accessory apartment, which means a dwelling which contains both a one family dwelling unit and meets the requirements for an accessory occupant uh, apartment. I do agree that's probably, that's probably the only case where there's a question, but in that particular case, one it's probably one dwelling. That's the way I would read the code. I believe the Salt Lake Code has some some terminology about housekeeping and but we'll, those are things that we it's good feedback. We'll, we'll clear that up. So I'm not at all against the wording. Is it but as I think about what Kay's talking about there, is there any opportunity for somebody to come in and talk what's reasonable? I mean, can we say if if someone comes in and can they make a case that yeah, that's reasonable. I think I think the ordinance allows for the director or his designee to to uh, consider each case. I was going to say there's been a couple of questions that I I would expect Bryce, Brian, myself to exercise some common sense here. That's because, not a lot. You know, I, I can give you an example of the multifamily question that came up and said, "Hey, you know," um, and I'll I'll be careful here because um, I'm getting close to this category. But if if um, if we had uh, a, a PUD that had um, a, a retirement community, you know, probably not going to generate 95 gallons of, of garbage for every single unit. And I think I think we've got some common sense that we can exercise. But most of the circumstances in the multifamily housing fall into that student realm where they've got six or eight, you know, students in one unit, and we're not. We're not in this realm of hey, they're not generating 95 uh, 95 gallons of, of refuge. It's usually more than that, and so I think I think if we can have some latitude, if the council understands we've got some latitude there, hopefully you know we can we can be reasonable about it. Does that make sense? We don't plan on going back. We're not planning on going back in. Forcing everybody to upgrade their service size, it's it's more for the situation where we have a repetitive problem. Now we have a tool that we can uh, talk to them. That's at least from our side. That we will go back and tidy things up a bit and and uh, bring this back to you. Thank you. I, these rates are already in this. The rates are already schedule. in the consolidated fee schedule. The ordinance amendment. We, I think we need to tidy it up a bit. 
and so probably come back and just uh, I would anticipate present that to you one more time in work session and then um, I guess we'll, we'll work with Cliff and, and Bob Trombley and, and uh, that way it's good. All right, sounds good. Thank you very much. Well, let's move on to item number two, which is inspecting the stormwater pollution protection plan. Price. We called it a couple weeks ago, September 19th, and I think the previous meeting we talked about stormwater protection plan fees. Um, we initially came with an initial proposal um, sent by Public Works with, with those rates, which are comparable to the number of cities around uh, around Provo. Um, after some discussion uh, and recommendation by Council Member Harding, we went back and looked at whether or not this could be do done logolinearly. Um, came back with this formula, which is based on uh, on a square root of the number of acres times one hundred fifty dollars plus the base rate. Um, after that meeting, the last meeting, the Utah Valley Home Builders Association expressed some concerns, and I shared those with you in emails. So I won't address them entirely. Um, one of the complaints, though, was that um, the presentation that we did was not in SIRE prior to the meeting, so they didn't have a chance to really review it and were concerned about trying to pass it that same night. We're in the same boat today. Um, it's not uncommon for presentations at this meeting to be um, presented for the first time that you see them and not in SIRE, but uh, that's the case here. So where this item appears on the agenda tonight, we're asking that you'll continue it to the October 17th meeting, which is two weeks from today, in order to give people time for to review and provide feedback. Um, after meeting with them, uh, we've gone, you may recall, we've gone back with the uh, Public Works, the stormwater folks, had asked them to do a regression and look at uh, how the fees on that formula would fit over uh, different uh, size properties. And they, this chart shows uh, the SWIP fee, that red line, based on one acre, and then some proposed steps. I'll come to that one in a minute. And this is the broader f formula uh, across an inf well, eventually an infinite number of acres, which is another concern that the Home Builders Association had. In talking to the Home Build Association, one of the things that, that um, they, they, they were concerned about was um, using a formula as a means of calculating. So one of the things that came out of that discussion was to have the Public Works come back with a table based on this and what they thought were some appropriate steps. And these steps here tend to uh, follow roughly what you see in, in previous formulas or calculation or tables for uh, inspection fees. And so that's the, what they're proposing. And then um, what we're asking for council to do is in order to put this into the resolution, we're asking council to choose between the formula and the table um, for inclusion. And so that we're going to request a motion to set the stormwater pollution prevention plan fees by choosing either the formula or the table for inclusion in a resolution updating the consolidated fee schedule um, and then continue that consideration for two weeks to October 17th. The Home Builders prefer which one? This one? They, pref they prefer this, although they would like to see it capped at 20 acres. That's my understanding. Chair, since um, Deanne Hughes from the Home Builders Association is here, could, could we give her a minute to, instead of us explaining what they're Questions First of all, thank you, Cliff, for um, inviting us to come back and have a meeting with Public Works and uh, Engineering and going over the things, the different tables and numbers. I did um, come at that last meeting fully expecting that first graph that capped it. $350 to be passed. And so I thought, wow, we, we see the next numbers with the formula. So that's why it was a little jarring because it would go on infinity. 
uh, with the numbers. And so we were kind of concerned about that. I did contact the top six builders that have pulled permits in Provo since January of this year through this year and, and talked to all six of them and um, their representatives and, and gave them the different options of what was happening. And of course, they reminded me that all fees add to the burden of the cost for the homeowners in the end and the affordability of it, which you're all very aware of. And then we talked about the, it, the first one had a $200 base fee. And um, it was just it was just kind of discerning how it could go higher, higher, higher. And we talked about also, it wasn't actually very clear when this would be paid. I, I assumed, you're not supposed to assume anything, but I assumed it was a development and that's what it was. And so we talked about if somebody develops five acres and they sell a lot, you know, do they have to come in again? And of course, yes, they do because the state law requires that, that they have to pay a SWIP again. They have to re, they don't necessarily have to pay the city again, but they have to re um, submit that SWIP proposal and that report of what they're going to be doing. So with all of that behind us, um, we were just kind of concerned about those main basic things is that how many inspections does it really take to go out and is there other inspections that are happening at the same time that could be included in some of the SWIP inspections? That's what I asked too and they said no, that has to be a specific. Well yeah, they're, they're looking at that but they could be doing something else. That's what I was told no. <coughs> I would have to turn over to public works for that so, because I don't think so. So the SWIP inspections are performed by certified stormwater inspectors, which are building permit. First of all, you have to understand how the, the building inspection and the and the utility inspections occur in Provo. They're not done by the same people. It's not the same so, department. It's not the same department. It's, so you've got a building inspector who's not looking at any utilities. That, well, that's probably overgeneralizing, but but they're they're building inspectors. Then you have engineering inspectors who are doing utilities, roadway, concrete, those sorts of things, curb gutter, sidewalk. And then um, I think in a perfect world, we would get our, our public works inspectors to be able to inspect <coughs> things for water. Um, the difficulty in, we're required to, at a minimum once a month to inspect SWIP even if nothing else is going on. And so there's no guarantee that right. they would be inspecting something else when they're there. And so um, I think we have to assume the worst case that we're out. Um, for example, the high school, we don't have public works inspectors on that job, period. Because um, it's all, it's the state, it's the school, um, but yet we are required to do SWIP inspections. And so there are cases where there is no overlap and depending on the life of a project, um, even if it's an ivory home subdivision, our, our public works inspectors are long gone, the streets and utilities are all in, but you're building homes now, which, which we're required to inspect for SWIP. So I don't think there's as much um, double coverage as, as you might think. Most, most Certainly some, um, but Given the way we're set up in the city with our inspectors, that's less likely. And then just, um, I say, definitely there would be opportunities for that, but I don't know that it's as much as. But you're saying your building department does their other inspections, but not the SWIP, is what you're telling me. Right. I think it's understandable that when the, when the when the builder comes in and puts down their money for a building inspection, and we don't haven't had a separate SWIP fee that that assumption could be made that it's covering everything and it really hasn't. It, it just, we haven't been charging for the SWIP inspections that we've been required by the state to do. Okay. Um, and as a norm, it has been the same inspectors in different cities. And so I'm going from that information that it was the same inspectors. And again, that that's nothing new to Provo. We've we just haven't meshed those responsibilities in the way the inspections have been done. So, okay. And you can do that if you if you train them and have them certified as SWIFT inspectors, but Provo yeah, hasn't yeah. chosen to do that. Yes. Yeah. It's, so. there, there's what four four main things they're looking for when they're out there. Um, I know Highland has it all online now, and so with Highland they do a, a weekly report actually for what's been disturbed, and so they don't have to have an inspectors 
out there running around as much. When they do their monthly inspection, which is required, then they already have a report from the builder of what has happened and they just check that. So that those were the, our main concerns was um, the, the cost of it um, and how it was being allocated back to the inspections. So can I just make a point on when this is collected? So it, it's a little bit different depending on the situation. So if you have an Ivory or a DR Horton or someone who, who takes this from bare ground to homes, um, it's charged at the time of development where, where it's presumed that they're on site responsible for SWIFT from day one until, until the subdivision is completed. Now, if they go and sell a lot to, to Cliff, um, then Cliff would be required at the time of building permit, um, he would be charged a SWIP fee as well because now he's responsible for the SWIP um, on that lot. Does that make sense? It seems like it would be double. There could be double. I mean, someone does a development, puts the lots in, but he's not building the homes. So he's going to be paying it. The whole so a if, if he if comes to build a home now, he comes in from it, they will be got SWIP. Well, I don't know about that, but let me get charged again. It seems like. It's so because, it's because you, the state requires each entity to do it so if, if it switch on switch owners between the development and then later the construction the state actually requires a permit to be charged well and if, if you think about how the process if you have a developer developing bare ground they've got their contractor out there who who is then responsible for SWIP once that contractor is no longer in the picture they can't be held responsible for SWIP for that piece of ground if they sell it. So then whoever's building or, or occupying that piece of ground then assumes the responsibility of SWIP and would need to generate their own SWIP plan because that builder's now stepped out of the picture. Now that's true, but take your every home situation. They clear, they do the development, they build a house, so they pay up at the top. Do they ever pay again when they do the house? Then? As long as they don't sell that lot, they won't be charged again. You see then that, that gives them they pay once, everybody else pays twice. That's true. So the developer either pays it and it's on record of being paid, and it doesn't matter who builds the house. Well, and they still have to have the inspections, and they still have to do what's required, but they shouldn't have to pay the fee again. Let me let me throw one other piece that, uh, and I'll, I think Brian was trying to say it, and I'll, I'll say it a little bit differently to try to help understand. And, and I think this is one issue, I, I told Cliff this morning, if if there was a concern of being fair, this is one that I pointed out to, to Cliff. But you have to realize that when the, the land developer comes in, he puts all his straw bales and everything he's got around all the inlet boxes, he's making the protection, and he's required to keep that in place. Ivory Homes can do that from day zero and all the way through the end. But if you have a land developer that comes in and sells lots, he removes all of that, all of that water quality, um, all the, the wattles and everything that, that protect the, um, the structures, and then it's transferred and we get a whole new plan, whole new setup by individual lot owners in the second circumstance. So, so it's, it's, it's a whole new... But the fee isn't new. But, but it requires, it's not, it's not the same for our inspectors to go out and say, hey, I'm doing the exact same thing that Ivory's got set up from day zero. All of a sudden, now they have a whole different setup on individual lots that they have to look but at. But it's specific on what they have to do. So Whether it's me doing it on a lot or Ivory doing it on a lot, you still have to do it. So it's, it's actually a time period. Because if it's Ivory, he's going to be there for the next 12 months and he's going to be getting all the houses in. He'll be responsible for that one initial report that was submitted to the state of Utah Division of Water Quality. Mm -hmm. But if he's a developer that just develops land, he's got five acres or a, a, a person who owns his own land and he just get two acres and he put it in, he's going to be paying the same exact fee. And now those, each one of those lots are going to be paying the same fee too. And he's going to be gone. And so the city is still collected twice. And, and I understand, I understand the argument. It, all I'm saying is it's not a black and white line that you can say, hey, pay the first two thirds of it by the land developer and the last third by the home builders. I, you, you can't. Well, what, what if you did it, the developer pays it or the building permit stage pays it? Well, I, I, 
I, I think the point that I'm, I think the point that I'm trying to make is if you have two different developments going on, there's a little bit of an overlap where it's it's not it's actually costing the city less in inspection time and and fees. It actually takes less of our time for an Ivory or a Dr. Horton or Woodside Homes because they go from zero, you know, they build the homes versus somebody that comes in and builds a home after the fact. It actually takes us extra work. And I'm not I'm not saying it's double. Don't 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 get me wrong. So what's there. the extra work? Because they're they're now having to review a new plan because all of those water quality items were pulled out by the original land developer. So now they're going out and looking at a brand new set of items out there. Well, so so maybe I, separate the two by so if you take a, a developer, comes in, develops the site, they've taken care of their SWIFT, they've paid their SWIFT fees and inspections, and then let's say there's Again, this is a total hypothetical situation. There's four years between the time the subdivision is completed and they sell the lot. Four years later, someone comes in and starts building. That's that's the extreme, but that maybe illustrates that this is now a completely different situation. It's the same now as if someone comes and pulls a permit up on, on a lot that's set vacant for decades. As far as the amount of work that our inspectors have to go through, and in inspecting stormwater pollution prevention. And so, again, this is to cover the cost of inspections. It's not It's not like an impact fee, that the impact is the same over. It's pretty much it, an impact fee. <laughs> well, but not really, it's an inspection fee. Yeah, it's an inspection fee. It's, a, it's the cost to at least recover some, if not all, and that, that I know that was a question, of the cost of the inspection, and, and as it being a city fee, the city has the the total responsibility of setting what that fee is, correct? As versus of impact fee, and, and we do understand and appreciate that. But at the same time, you know, when we're, we're thinking it's going to be a hundred dollars, and it's going to cap at three fifty, and then when we see fourteen hundred, that's a big jump. Well, so and I'll I'll get back to that, but that's what I'm saying. This is a cost to cover inspections. Can you just make one more comment? Before sure. That's gone. You came up with those knowing you're going to have to do a certain amount of inspections. So to come up with those fees, inspections are covered. But now we're saying we're going to do them again because we're going to do more inspections or okay. added inspections. <laughs> so let me talk a little bit how the fee, this, again, it's, it's not exact. This is an approximation. So we went, after Mr. Harding asked us to go back and find something that was not stepped, we went. We pulled some building permit information, at least the council staff did, because it's hard to correlate size with inspections, and, and really it's based on time. We're required to be there out there monthly. And so the acreage piece of that roughly is correlated to the time aspect of the project. And so we know from our building permit information, the minimum amount of time we're going to be out there is, is four months, roughly. Um, that's about as quick as someone can be in there, get their project done, and be out. And so that's kind of why you saw the base fee go up a little bit because we, we weren't necessarily accounting for for that. And then we took it out. We had a, a sampling of 10 or 12 different projects from, from time of building permit to occupancy, and, and that's how we projected the cost. And so, and then we just did a best fit curve and came up with an equation and and Again, it's it's not perfect. We're gonna even. I mean, if you look at the steps, we're gonna win some. We're gonna lose some. We're not covering all of our costs on some. Maybe we're, you know, maybe we're a little high in others. But um, so it's to capture the exact cost. Unless you're gonna retro bill a developer, there's gonna be some of that guessing and and how how much time it's gonna take you to to do it anyway. Mr. Um, so I, I got the message you know, pretty loud and clear that builders like simplicity and, and not complicated. But what you just said you know, about retro billing, you know, is that is that something that the builders would be would be interested in instead of a, a fee up front, count how many inspections there were, and <laughs> or another way to do that would be to say, um, you know, for X amount of acres, here's the price, and that's good for up to 12 inspections. 
And if it goes beyond that, then um, you know there's going to be a, a, an additional fee later on. And that way, um, if you have someone that's just developing the land, um, you know they would be paying more at that first rate. But if someone's developing the land and building the houses, they may extend beyond that, and so they, have, they themselves are receiving more of those inspections themselves, and so um, then they would they would pay more. Um, Anyway, I've just is, is there is there another way to approach it rather than just a, a, a fee per acre up front? Is there is there another way to, to level it a little bit more? I, I would let me answer that because by saying that, I think if you were to, and I'm thinking back to some other fee discussions we've had with other with other departments, if we were to have to come back and account for the exact number of fees and then bill and all that, we create a whole new bureaucracy within one procedure within the city, which administratively would cost the city more money to do. And I think it also would create kind of a headache for the developers for having to now deal with extra bills that come later. Whereas we built this uh, based on, I mean, that's the curve based on the formula. You'll notice that these rates correspond to the center point or the crossing point of where the, the curve meets a step. And so this, you know, you get down to here, this is somewhere between four and seven inspections, and if it if it takes if, if it only takes us four, great. The city probably saved a little bit of money. If it takes us seven, the city loses a little bit of money. But on balance, we hope that that will, you know, even out. Well, I I, I guess we would realize this is the first time we've ever done this fee. We have no data, right? And so we're we're doing our best to come up with with an initial fee. Um, there's nothing that says two years from now when we have data on our inspections and our revenues that we can take a look at it and say, hey, look, we're, we're way over or we're way under. And, and the other side of that is, is as we've gone to different, if you notice that we've gone to different departments and looked at fees, some fees are, tend to be very competitive. Other fees, uh, as, we've, as, as we've looked, they've been very arbitrary in, in how they've been set and often very low. And you have the issue of if every city just keeps calling each other's city and say, what do you charge for this? Or they look on their fee schedule and say, well, that looks good, without ever evaluating. What we're finding as we evaluate is that a lot of the things that we perform are actually costing us more money than we're collecting. And, and, uh, and so at the end of the day, this may be higher than others. And I think rightly so, the, the Home Builders Association is, is concerned that this kind of inflation to their cost for SWIP fees is going to hit other cities when they see, oh, Provo's doing it, we can charge more. And I almost guarantee you, many of the cities are waiting for somebody to set the bar a little higher and say, yeah, we can charge that because that's really what it's costing us. Well, this is a fair fee and it covers our cost, and I think we should do it. And the other considerations are nice, but I thought that's what we decided as the council that we want to cover our cost. At least, if, if not recover, at least you're identifying what it's really costing you, or and much more than. We're not recovering our cost. We need to know we're not recovering our cost. We've agreed to subsidize it. Let, it, let the rest of the city subsidize a certain, a certain activity. And I don't think that's right. I, I think we should recover our cost as best we can. Whether it's, whether it's more than Highland or Oro, I don't care. It just needs to be fair. Yeah. Uh, Bryce told me a story about a, 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 a city mayor up north he was talking to. He was talking about water rates and they were comparing water. People were trying to compare water rates between Pleasant View City and, and Ogden and other places. And the mayor's answer was, I don't care what it costs in the other places. This is what it costs us. And and his view was that we, what we should be charging for our rates. Mr. Connect. So, on one hand, we do want to cover reasonable cost. Yeah. The other, if we can uh, find ways to cross train and and reduce or combine, you know, visits, so that we're not uh, going out on separate visits, and, and just find a way to bring the cost down so that we don't have to charge so much. Charging, and we, we are getting quite a bit behind here, by the way. I'm just trying to figure out how we're going to do this. Um, okay, I, I will try to fix this real quick. Um, I do think that I, I would appreciate if we just make sure that, that these fees aren't more than they need to be um, as far as what, what the true cost is. And, and I know, you know, there's the uncertainty you talked about. I would almost 
want to err maybe a little bit on the conservative side, make them a little bit less because of that uncertainty um, going forward. Um, how many projects do we have that are larger than 50 acres? I, I don't know. Yeah, and that, that was kind of the point of, you know, the home builders concerned about it going on forever. Well, it only goes on as far as your development is, right. which I would say very rarely do we have any that are even above 20. But okay. yeah. I'm uh, aware of a 28 acre one right now and, and one in the teens and uh, we barely will get over. Where this becomes an issue, I think, for the home builders is when you get out to some of the cities that have a lot of developable land, yeah. they're concerned if you get a large one that that formula will give an infinite calculation, right? For more infinitely finite. large, yeah. Yeah. So, so the reality is this, just, this was just a way of, of, um, of capping it somewhere. And then the last, last thought is, you know, formula versus table. If, if the builders prefer table, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. I think bu building the steps based on that curve has made it a lot better. If you go back to the original, some of them were doubling, and, and these are these are some smaller steps, and I think and more logical steps. So I, I I'm fine um, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with the table if that's what the builders prefer. So that's. I think closer to move forward with the step table. Yeah. And continue the meeting. Continue the <laughs> resolution to two weeks from today. Okay. Two weeks. Second, can we clarify that the home builders are on board with this? They, um, this is the first I've seen the numbers. Oh, okay. um, they were, all of them were on board with steps based upon fairness on how much it actual cost was and not having as a profit margin coming right. into the city. And, and we do want to pay our fair share. Um, the simplicity of the table is it makes it a little bit easier for their staff as they're trying to decide if they should even buy that parcel of land. So yes, the steps was better. I still have a little bit of issue with the numbers and only because I saw your first numbers. And your first numbers were going like, I, mean, I actually came and I'm like, oh, that, yeah, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be okay. And so the numbers are, what, four times? Well, two, <laughs> this one would be, Two, they two, started, three, out at they started out at a hundred dollars. Yeah. yeah. And cap. We can't make a profit. We're not supposed to. We're allowed to recover our costs. You can cover your costs. Mm -hmm. so as long as there, yeah. yeah. As long as as long as as long as those costs are true and accurate, yeah. we need to pay our fair wear. And we and we totally want everybody to understand that we understand that, and we are always striving for that. Um, but at the same time, we're trying to keep our costs down and as you know affordability is not even a word in Utah County anymore. It's hard to buy a home here. So, so I'll really second that Ed. and then this would be the proposal that would come forward next meeting. It'll, it'll be in the resolution on the 17th at the regular meeting. Oh. Can, can I just ask, it doesn't have to be part of the motion, but just ask in the intervening two weeks if we can just double check and make sure that those numbers aren't high and, and maybe Look for streamlining if, if, if we can. Um, if we can cover our costs, but we can we can help everyone if we can bring down our costs. We have discussed in uh, with with other departments getting um, other inspectors, other people that are there to you know take even just a quick look and say, hey, we've got a potential problem. Let's make a phone call to the right SWIFT people. You know, send them out. It's not necessarily saving another trip but we have had that you know second set of eyes looking at it and saying hey let's let's get some help so that it reduces the number of staff that we have to have and a side note to that the builders that i talked to the developers um, on those top six they all said they actually appreciated that call from the city because they're not out there all the time and another subcontractor has been out there and sometimes it's been breached and so he's glad to know Thank you for your time. And if I could just add, I, I don't think this needs to be part of the motion either. I would encourage staff to engage once again with the home builders and kind of uh, show them our calculations, so to speak. And I feel more comfortable uh, about it if, if they're convinced that, you know, this just does look like the true cost. Thank you. And just just to be to clarify the costs for these inspections, we basically took the evaluation of our engineering inspection fees that has been, you know, that Cliff staff did you know, six months or so ago, 
and use those numbers for the inspections. And then again, it's just a minimum amount of time we figured we'd be on on one site for the base fee. So I think we're pretty close, but we'll we'll definitely look at it. Any discussion of the motion? Move on to item three: discussion on possible code changes with the signage. So that's one of the main issues that was brought up last time was grandfathering, and I think it was Mr. Jones to talk about what we uh, came up with in relation to that. Right, skin grading. There we go. Awesome. Uh, so, in this version, um, we've, I've tried to address those concerns. So, first of all, uh, this version, which was sent out to you and, and should have been published uh, in Sire, um, shows the actual addition of the hold times and the brightness standards into chap Chapter 6.06, .06, which is part of our business licensing. And then, if you'll scroll down just a little bit, Bryce. You can't, you can't target that little tiny arrow without being able to see it. <laughs> what happened? Is this right? Uh, Let's see. What did we do? We done the whole page. Uh oh, that's what we did. Oh, right. Yeah, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so up a little bit more. Okay, so subparagraph five. So this is how I addressed uh, the grandfathering question, and I put. Uh, for reasons that I perhaps only expressed to Mr. Sewell, I can't remember who all I sent that email to, I actually put a separate grandfathering clause in the hold, sec, hold time section and the brightness section. And the reason why is because hold, in my mind, this was just kind of a choice I made, so, so counsel please weigh in, but in my mind, your ability to use hold times that you're used to may have a practical business effect in the sense that if you are currently, say that you're an entity that's currently, because you're grandfathered, using full motion video, for the city to then come and say, now you can only change it every eight seconds, is a significant difference as to, as to the amount of advertising that you can do and the format of your advertising, right? On the other hand, uh, in, at least in my mind, complying with the brightness standards shouldn't really have a practical business impact. So the way that I've drafted this is I've put it in the, in the brightness section, skipping ahead, in the brightness section, the grandfathering clause says, you're grandfathered unless your equipment is actually capable of complying with the brightness standards. And if it is, then you're not grandfathered and you still have to comply with them, if that, if that makes sense. So uh, with regard to this subsection five, this is the grandfathering with regard to uh, hold times. And it says, any sign that was in operation prior to May 28, 2013 is not subject to the requirements as long as it's not replaced, reconstructed, upgraded, moved, or otherwise substantially changed. Now, the date, as you'll see from the note over here, that's when we first passed our electronic display sign ordinance. And so anybody that wasn't already in operation as of that date would not be grandfathered anyway. They would be subject to the ordinance that we have right now, or they would have an illegal sign. And so that's why that date went into the grandfathering section. And then if you'll scroll down a little bit more, I'll show you the one with regard to brightness. Okay, right there in subsection four. So I added, th I added these words that aren't in the previous section. It says, and is not reasonably capable of complying with the brightness standards in this section. So if you're already in operation and you can't reasonably uh, turn the brightness down, then you're exempt until you replace the sign, replace or upgrade or, or repair, repair the sign. But if you can turn down the sign, then we expect you to. So again, that was entirely my idea, uh, but that made sense to me as I was drafting it. So that's the way I, I proposed it. And those are really the only changes since the last time that we looked at the ordinance. So, okay. So uh, enforcement, however, enforcing is that an easy thing to to tell? Well, yeah, Gary and I technology can they say this is this type and this style, so you have capability to change. Gary and I talked about that. I don't know, Gary, what do you, how many, do you have any kind of guesstimate as to how many grandfathered signs don't meet the brightness standards? I mean, I know we've talked about a couple, but. 
more than two or three, less than 25. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, I, so Gary's probably a better person to, to ask. We did, t I did speak with it about, to Gary about it, and, uh, and uh, we were on the same page at least at that point, but you're certainly more qualified to speak about the difficulty enforcement than I am. With this one, it says reasonably capable of complying with brightness standards. In my mind, um, it wouldn't be reasonable to, uh, somebody has a sign that's going 24-7, and they can turn it down, but someone has to manually go in and on the computer turn it down. They can't automatically through the software do it. And so um, on a Saturday, we're not going to require them to come in at, you know, six o'clock at night in December now to turn it down and then come back in Sunday morning uh, during the day at nine o'clock in the morning and, and be able to turn it up. To me, that, that doesn't mean it's reasonable. They, if they could just sit it, if, if the, uh, uh, their hardware comes with sensors that can automatically sense the ambient light and can turn it down automatically, and all they have to do is, is do a one-time setting like you can with, you know, if you went out and bought a sign today, then, then that, then in my understanding of the intent of this ordinance, we would tell them, yeah, you need to come in to compliance with the brightness standards because you can easily do it. But if it can't automatically sense and they have to <coughs> go to all this extra effort, then we would say, no, that's not reasonable to comply with the current brightness standards. And adding to that, if you go back up to subsection one, Bryce, uh, the standards as written actually Require, require that they become that they come equipped with automatic dimming technology. So in my mind, when I say, if you're not able to comply, if you are able to comply, it's because you already meet number one, which is that you are automatically able to do that. So that was the intent. Mr. Harding. Can I just go through a couple of um, scenarios? So um, for the motion section, you know, I don't, want, I don't know if I should be too specific with examples, but you know, say there's a regional shopping center in the northeast area of the city, and they have full motion video. Um, we're basically saying you're good to continue to do that until you replace, reconstruct, upgrade, move, or substantially change your sign. And then at that point, you would need to come into full compliance as far as basic at all times. Correct. And just. It's, um, <clears throat> It's, I'm not. I'm not going to assert that it couldn't be improved. But that the reason why I use those particular words is because those are the same words used elsewhere in the code for uh, determining whether you can upgrade uh, a billboard, a, a non-electronic billboard to a, to electronic. Okay. Right. So we just use the same standard. If I remember right, there was a certain very fast car wash um, business that wanted that, that were, was grandfathered in, but they their sign was breaking down because they felt or the idea was that they couldn't place it or couldn't fix it up um, without losing that grandfathering. Um, Correct. Is, would that be covered here if, if, if that regional shopping center decided that they, they needed to replace some of the hardware, but they, they weren't, they just were trying to get it back to the original right. condition, would that, would they be then required to so in answer, so your specific question about would they be grandfathered, the answer is no, but that specific business, now this wouldn't apply to another business in the same situation, that specific business would be covered because lower down in the ordinance we actually propose changing the extent of the high churn area to include that business. Does that make sense? So they would no longer be non-conforming, they would be conforming <coughs> and have the ability to change the, every eight seconds. But right now they're doing more than that, isn't it? Full motion? Uh, I don't know. It's not full motion. Okay. And they haven't expressed any interest to have full motion. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Miss Santiago. Riverwoods? What's that? Riverwoods? Well, Riverwoods. Riverwoods is, but I well, I was talking about supersonic uh, car wash. Okay. Because you were asking if they were going to be grandfathered. Sorry. Did I, yes. did I misunderstand the question? I, I was I was saying like. Oh, you were like saying supersonic. If, you were saying if, if Riverwoods. 
Okay, if they if they were repairing their sign in the same way that this other business yes. is, then no. No, they would lose their grandfathering? Correct. Okay, based on replace, reconstruct, upgrade, move, or otherwise substantially change. Right. And they would no longer have video. If, 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 the, if the change is significant enough that they would have to come to Mr. McGinn and apply for a permit in order to do the change, then they would no longer be grandfathered and would have to um, to meet the, meet the standards in, in the new ordinance. Now, there's nothing to say that in the meantime, now remember again that at least as proposed by Mr. Sewell, this is a short-term solution and not the end of the discussion on electronic signs. So there's nothing to say that in the meantime, there can't be a decision made to actually expand, to open up certain areas of the city to full motion video or, or to make other uh, other changes. But as currently written, if you needed a permit, you wouldn't be grandfathered anymore. And just to follow up on that comment, um, I was thinking of this as sort of phase one of the discussion that the minimal amount that would need to be done to sort of solve our legal problem plus the supersonic. And a phase two to me could include the discussion of full motion video. Do we want that to be available in the future, like at Riverwoods, maybe at the Palm South, and, and things like that? But I was hoping to kind of keep those separate so we could get this together first. And I guess uh, so the counter so that one is. Uh, if you wanted to remove that restriction and just say they're just expressly flat out grandfathered based on the date, regardless of whether they replace and, and update, um, my recommendation would be, even if you wanted to do that with the hold times, to not do that with the brightness uh, for some of the same reasons I've already expressed. And if you did want to do it with regard to, to motion, um, then I guess the one, the policy consideration, I think the other, the other scenario to, th to think about is You've got somebody who's got nothing right now but a, a small reader sign that's continuously scrolling, and if you if you remove this restriction when that sign gets upgraded or replaced with a 10 by 10 full full digital sign, then it would still be grandfathered if you remove this language. If that makes sense. So, and again, not arguing one way or the other, just saying that's the policy consideration. So with, with the, the reader, the crawler signs, so this this would accommodate that for, for as long as they don't replace the grade, yada, yada. Correct. Um, and at which point they would need to come to the lines. Correct. Okay. And then lastly, I think we talked about Walgreens uh, on uh, State and Moldog. They got some motion coming in. I imagine that would also be, be like. Right. That would fit in here as well. Right. Okay. right. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Santiago. So could you explain number two? No electronic display signs show exceed a brightness level of more than three tenths foot candles above ambient light as measured using a foot candle lux meter perpendicular to the electronic display sign based measured at ground level and at the distances shown in the table below. How do you how do you know what that means as far as the brightness of something? As far I can't as, explain like, it, and I don't know what it means. I've co I've copied it straight from the standard that's already in our ordinance okay. with regard to electronic display signs. That was proposed by community development because I assume that they know how to enforce that, but I don't. <laughs> you have a uh, lux meter, and you go out, and then when you have a sign, you try not to get the sign on an angle and read it. You try to be perpendicular to the sign. And what it does is it's a measurement of the light and it takes into account ambient light all around you and the sign. And so it keep, as the ambient light grows, so as business develops and we get more businesses and more lights and street lights and cars and things like that, as the ambient light in the area goes, your sign uh, can get be brighter. And as the ambient light is darker, your sign has to be darker. With daytime and, versus nighttime. Yes, and, and, and you know, in daytime, twilight, mm -hmm. you know, uh, cloudy days. So the sign, the, the new technology with signs allows those, uh, the brightness to fluctuate during the day depending on the ambient. So, so if you go look at, again, I like to use the example of that Reagan billboard at Walgreens on, Fifth West State Street and Bulldog Boulevard right there. 
Uh, go and take a look at it. You know, right now where it's pretty sunny, um, it'll be pretty bright. You go back at midnight and it's it's fairly dim. And so they have a sensor, so they, they keep within that. And one thing that we uh, will do is we're going to take a look and make sure uh, that these are the best uh, industry standard uh, light uh, measurements and, and, and things to deal with. This is kind of, when we originally got this, this was a national standard, again, for billboards and things like that on freeways. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Nick? Yeah, I've used one of those meters. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I, I you can do it for us then. All um, right. I think it's in the best interest also of the people that are running the billboard to reduce the power consumption when it's possible and feasible. Otherwise, you're running at full blazing brightness at midnight and maybe blinding people when you're probably doubling your power consumption at that time versus what you could be doing if you just tone it down. Right. So at this point, I think. Um, yeah, what the, we've addressed to the best of our ability the questions that were raised in the previous discussion and so I think we're just looking for either a, a motion to continue this on to uh, an actual evening meeting for to consider approval or for direction or if there are further changes that are needed. So you mm -hmm. whether the, this is something the planning commission needs to see? Oh, right, right. Yes, it is. Uh, I forgot because we were talking just about the chapter six part of it, but because we're also making changes to title 14, it would need, uh, the motion would actually be to send it to the planning commission for their consideration. Is that what you were going to say, Gary? Okay. And I know that when we were talking about sign ordinance before, we had Jesco and Reagan always wanting to give their two cents worth. That is this something that is really going to make a dip, much of a difference to them if they had input or do, do we feel like we need to contact them? At our last study meeting, um, what, two weeks ago, I guess? Uh, I, do you remember his name? I don't remember his name. He, I saw him back there nodding at me the whole time, but I don't know his address. Right, right, right. from Reagan. Yes, from Reagan was from here, Reagan. and I spoke with him afterwards. And he did actually thank me for talking nicely about a Reagan sign, the one, <laughs> the one at Walgreens. He said, he said I, I think that's the first time I've ever had a city official say something complimentary about one of our signs. And I said, I'll never let it happen again. <laughs> uh, and, and as we talked, he didn't really have any uh, real concerns because these standards, when this was originally done back in 2013, we actually worked fairly closely with him on some of the, these things. And, and if I could speak for him, I mean, he's not here, but uh, these are the standards that they um, want to adhere to and do adhere to kind of as a national or as part of a national organization and dealing with, uh, in particular, with federal highways. And so they are in favor of things like, like this. Um, and they would like to see signs that are brighter in doing that, that kind of reflects poorly upon their electronic signs too. And, and so it, as far as I know, they're, they're happy as we walked out. He said, I like the, the direction this is going. And, and he was here when it was continued to this meeting and I guess didn't feel the need to come back. I don't know. And what we're doing principally just affects on-premises signs rather than off-premises signs. So it, it would really only affect them to the degree that they're selling those signs to, you know, the stores and businesses. We make motion to move to the Motion by Mr. Stewart. Second by Mr. Is there any further discussion? I don't know if Planning Commission would, would consider these things or not, but the, kind of the two things that I'm a little still unsettled on is you know, looking at do we really want to expand the boundaries? And I even I even mentioned last time, um, you know, Center Street between the freeway and Fifth West is, is that really where we want to allow high turn signs? So I don't know if, if you know when the, when is the right time to weigh in on that. And then the other question is, um, you know, this is the, the federal highway standard, but is eight seconds is that good for our city? Would it be better to have it a little shorter? Would it be better to have it a little longer? Just you know, just looking at those kind of questions, if we're going to be doing this, 
let's let's make sure that we're we're comfortable with the acceptance. So those are the two things that I'm just a little unsettled on. Propose either a phase two or a phase three possible. Well, I think it would be good to talk to those who are going to be most affected by this change, too, and just kind of talk, about, <coughs> talk to those um, entities that you know, visit the mall. Some of these that will, you know, they no longer can do full motion video. I think we should let them know that probably this is probably not on there. Radar, if you get to reach out to them and let them know what the current proposal is and how this might affect them down the road and see if they have any suggestions or concerns. Okay, sounds good. Can we uh, ask staff to reach out to them as, as this moves through and give the feedback? Uh, sure. Yeah, and that, it, it, it's, this would go to. Uh, uh, planning Commission, we could reach out to people. Uh, as we reached out to Riverwoods, we'd say, be aware of this. This doesn't affect you right now. So. Well, they change their signage, does. Yeah, it, it, well, signage. yeah, but they'd have to replace, reconstruct, uh, uh, move or something, or substantially do it. If somebody comes in and upgrades in that, they have some light bulbs burned out and they replace them. We're, we don't consider that a violation of this. I mean, this is going to be a major. But it could, it'd be right that it could eventually affect them, of course. But uh, again, I, I don't say this to suggest that I'm opposed to reaching out to them. It's, it's great to get feedback. But um, that could be, as Mr. Sewell has indicated, a phase two or a phase three question to address because uh, even if they ever got to the point where it could have, could affect them, they could come in and ask for a ask for a text amendment to the grandfathering clause so that it doesn't affect them. And the council at that time could make a, dis a decision about it. I think most sophisticated people understand that if they make major upgrades, they're going to do grandfathering. I mean, that's that's been in the way we've operated government for years. It just doesn't change. And, and, yeah, and, and now that you bring that up, I guess the thing that I would say is that's actually already the case um, because right now they are. This is putting in express get grandfathering because we're putting it in the business licensing section. What they have right now is a non-conforming use under land use regulations, and those do automatically go away when you replace or upgrade the use. So they're actually already subject to that. And, and this actually would, I think, give them a little bit more protection. So the first one is not replace. So if they came in and they had a warranty issue with one of their signs and their their company had to come in and replace the whole sign because it was out of warranty. We wouldn't come back and say, oh, you, you replace this, you're, you're gone. In our mind, and with the non-conforming rights section, they'd have to be replacing it with an upgrade, a new, bigger, better type of model or something before we would consider that kicking in. Is there any further discussion on the motion? I guess I'll stay up here a sec. <laughs> um, and Mark Straper is here as well. Uh, and I've already admonished him to weigh in and correct me every time I misspeak, so <laughs> I hope he'll do that. Um, let's see, let's go ahead and um, Bryce, let, let's, let's, check the, let's check the evening meeting issue file. I'm looking for a version 1-1 instead of just version 1. It's the one that I sent out yesterday. And I, it looks like it's not in that folder, but maybe it's in the evening meeting.
Uh, no, that's not there yet. Okay. Um, yeah, there should there should be one that says one dash one exhibit B one dash one. I sent those out yesterday, and I was assuming that they got updated on Sire, but I don't know if they did. Um, I can send those to you again. Well, actually, you know, go back. Just go ahead and open version one, uh, not the one with comments, but the other one. This one. Yeah, let's go ahead and open that one. Maybe, maybe it got renamed. Let's scroll down. Scroll down to. Let's see. Go back up. I want to look at paragraph one. I can tell if it's okay. Well. This isn't quite the right version, but I'll, I, can, uh, I can talk to it. What's that? So, um, in after our last meeting, uh, there were some questions that were raised by um, Jeremiah Mon in particular in the public comments about some of the logistics. And so there were some specific issues that we wanted to address. Uh, and so we've made some updates to those. And the process that we went through is we met with the zoning committee and zoning compliance committee and talked about some of those changes and our intent to change them. And so this version one reflects, as I indicated in an email, uh, what came out of that meeting. Um, no, that's not it. No. Go back to the other one because the change, I'll, I'll just tell you what the change is. 1-1 um, as opposed to 1, it, it crosses out these line, these words right here, intent to occupy, and says the sub lessee's lease of the premises. That's the only change. Uh, and that's the version that I circulated yesterday. Um, so let me just walk through kind of for the public record what the changes were, and then, I, and then I'll go to version 2 and... and make some comments and answer some questions. Uh, when's this one scheduled to end? 345. Oh, good. Ten yeah. minutes. Whole 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, so the first thing that we did was um, we added uh, this sentence that says that owners and agents can act on their behalf. Then we also added this section. There was a, there was a, there was a concern, kind of a general concern raised in some of the emails and comments about Hey, this is unfair if you're requiring the sub lessee to actually have a full-blown contract with the landlord because really who they're contracting with is the sub lessor, right? And so this sentence was added to say, in those cases when you're talking about subleases, all, all you have to have is just the disclosures and an acknowledgement that the, per that the owner and the sub lessee both know that, both say that the person's going to live there, okay? Um, then in paragraph two, we added, uh, again, uh, owner's agent, uh, and uh, a loophole closer to say, but hey, if you're the tenant or the sub lessor, that doesn't make you an agent of the owner, that you're acting on your own. Uh, then three, four, and five are all the same, and six was amended to say, uh, instead of a class B misdemeanor, it's a class C misdemeanor but it's enhanceable if it's a second offense, okay? So that was the process we went through to get to this, to this version. Then, Bryce, if you could switch over to version two. So, and then this one, and the, and the reason why, and as I expressed my email, I was a little bit hesitant to just automatically say this was the official version is because I made some changes on my own that the committee hadn't really talked about. And so I was reluctant to just call this the official version. But the first thing I did is I inserted a new subsection one that now includes definitions. And the, really that was done for two purposes. One was just to make the whole ordinance easier to read because every time we use the word tenant or the word owner, we just use that instead of a whole bunch of qualifiers, right? The second reason I did it was that this subparagraph about the contract 
means that what I just explained to you about sub lessees actually applies to everybody. That if if you're one of those people that is is asserting that man, it's really just a huge pain to have a contract and I don't want to have one, then this says, well, as long as you have a piece of paper that includes the disclosures and an acknowledgement that you're living there, um, that's all we're asking for, and that's enough. Okay. Uh, so if you can scroll on down, three really say the same thing, but they come they become much shorter because of the uh, because of the definitions. Uh, four adds this sentence right here, which is just part of the definition of the contract now. Um, and and again, the current version of this says tenants lease of the premises instead of instead of intent to lease the premises. Uh, five and six remain the same, other than being shorter. And uh, seven, I think, is also the same as the previous version. It keeps going down. To make sure I didn't make any. Yeah, the, yeah. So again, it's a class C, uh, but not, but is enhanceable. Um, so just a couple comments uh, with regard to questions that I've heard, and then I'm happy to take other questions. So um, one of the questions that I was asked to address by, by a couple of council members is why this helps enforcement. And, 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 I, and I look at that and I look back at the, in our previous public hearing, one of the comments we heard was, you shouldn't do something unless it increases efficiency and we haven't heard anything about why this increases efficiency. And it's true that that wasn't something that was presented in the meeting, but it's something that was much discussed among uh, the Zoning Compliance Committee and coming forward with his recommendation. Um, currently, the process for investigating an over-occupancy case is very cumbersome in the sense that it involves uh, inspections, it involves sending zoning officers out to, to talk with uh, tenants that may or may not be cooperative or may or may not answer the door. It might include uh, sending zoning officers out to, for multiple hour periods, observe a residence to see if they can identify who lives there and who doesn't. And so one of the key aspects of this is that it simplifies that process down to this uh, simple question. Even though it's a separate violation, it's aimed at the same thing and it simplifies it down to this simple question of, uh, does everyone in the residence comply with this ordinance or not, which uh, with a streamlined process. Now, Again, several people have pointed out, I think completely accurately, that this will not solve every zoning enforcement problem. And that's, that's completely true. <laughs> Neither will anything else, <laughs> in my view. And so I don't see that as, I don't see that as, a, as a very compelling argument against this, um, simply because it's not uh, the perfect solution, because I don't think there is a perfect solution. Uh, we've also heard arguments from a number of groups, or arguments, I, I have trouble even probably using that word, assertions from some people that this just won't help. Um, and I guess I would say regarding those assertions, those assertions are coming from primarily uh, people who don't want the ordinance, the, over, the occupancy limits enforced, and two, from people who don't have any experience as zoning enforcement officers and or prosecutors prosecuting these kind of things. And, and so I want, I want you to know that this wasn't just a uh, kind of a random idea thrown out by, uh, by uh, the policymakers on the committee of, hey, let's just try this. This was from the people who were actually doing day-to-day -day enforcement, getting together and saying, what would most help us be able to do enforcement? This we reported to me even today that Kerry was not excited about this. That's just not what I've understood. But I mean, it's, it hasn't come from the council members of the committee. It's come from the people that are doing it, right? Correct, correct. The proposal originally came from Kerry and Mr. Draper. So. We're just implementing their proposal. Right, right, that's correct. Mr. McGinn, you had a comment as well? One thing that I think as far as making efficiency and making enforcement more streamlined is I think this will uh, be a deterrent in the sense that there's a lot of people in our community who want to obey the law and aren't going to uh, violate the law. And, but they go and they live in a place and they have no clue what the occupancy is. 
in, in the dwelling in which they're living. Um, and nobody really knows. And this will make it so that everybody who's actually living there will know. And then when people see it, you're going to have somebody say, well, hold it. I'm the fourth one who's going to be coming in here. There's only supposed to be three. I don't want to do this. And so I think it will, uh, because honestly, most people we, we run into in this community, once they understand and once we can educate, um, we, they want to comply with the law. And so when they know and don't enter into one, that's an easier situation to deal with then they don't know, and then we go do enforcement, and then they're, uh, it's the middle of November. Uh, now what do I do? I have no place to live. I have, you know, and so I think that's one of, one of the great benefits of this ordinance is it'll just put everybody, give everybody full disclosure of what the rules are surrounding their occupancy and the rental in which they're living. And, and I think that's exactly right, although the one, the add-on I would say to that is I have also seen comments in the last couple of weeks where people have taken comments, I think out of context from last meeting, where it was expressed that one of the purposes of this was for education, and they've attacked the ordinance as saying, if you're saying that this isn't the best thing you could do to educate. And so I would just address that by saying education is not the only goal of the proposed ordinance. While that is something we do want to accomplish, it is also an enforcement technique, and, and that's why this is what's being proposed, is because it does both. Mr. Stewart? I'd just like to second what Gary said, because people that are not obeying the law, I know they're not, don't want to. People, I think there's many, as Gary said, that want to obey if they knew. I think it would make a big difference. Right. Mr. Kennedy. And also, as a, when it comes to deterrence, for those that do know the law, we've then heard that, well, we knew the law, but we were told that it was never enforced, the city's not serious. So this sends the message that we are serious, you will have a contract, we may enforce. And so for those that are educated, they may think twice, like, well, maybe it's not really worth the risk because the risk is now higher. Right. And if, if I, uh, Mr. Harding, do you have a comment? Maybe. Uh, after, after, right? okay. it's, it's a different topic. So okay, sure. okay. Uh, so along those lines, one other comment that I just wanted to make, and I've made this to some of the council members uh, off, kind of offline, is that one of the attacks being made against the ordinance is really not about the substance of the ordinance. It's about whether or not the city's over-occupancy limits should be enforced or not. And while I don't uh, have any qualm with, with people's right to assert that that's an important question and asking their council members to address that, that issue uh, in another way. My personal belief is that that's really irrelevant to this ordinance in the sense that I believe this ordinance is necessary for any limit, not just for the limit that currently exists. And unless the city is going to wholesale say there are no occupancy limits, this is the, the next tool that we need to be able to enforce any occupancy limit, regardless of what that occupancy limit is. Um, then there were some other comments. I don't know, uh, I, I had sent around uh, an analysis. There was a, another, there was a concrete proposal for some changes that had been submitted by uh, Representative Thurston uh, with some assistance from uh, Shannon Ellsworth from our planning commission, I believe. And I sent that around with some comments. Mr. Sewell had asked me to go into that, uh, I think, tonight, I'm, and, and maybe in this meeting. I'm happy to go into that in this meeting, but I know that we're already behind schedule. So um, I think at that point I'm just going to kind of ask for some guidance on how much more you want me to talk or if you just want me to answer specific questions now. <laughs> maybe we can handle it on a question basis. Okay. I just like I know Gary's talked to Shannon. I didn't get a hold of her. You know, I just like to hear briefly what her. She's pretty concise and probably to the point. Um, what she didn't like about the ordinance, and can you do that quickly, or is that the longer than that? Point? Sure. I I don't know that. Um, well, I can't distinguish between what all I got was a document with a recommended uh, an, uh, alternative proposal. And there were some reasons listed on it, but I don't know what of that came from Shannon and what of it came from Representative Thurston. The principal issues that it handled were um, 
trying to reduce the, the burden of the contract issue by turning it into something less than a contract that has to, that has to be uh, provided. And this version two kind of actually does that pretty much in, this, in, the, in the same way that was proposed, as long as what was proposed was intended to mean that both parties were gonna sign it. Um, and, and if not, then that created a pretty big loophole. And so we had some concerns if that wasn't what it meant. Uh, there was concern, their proposal was to reduce the original, uh, the initial uh, enforcement all the way down to an infraction rather than class C. And the, the council members of the zoning committee uh, recommended not doing that because they thought that sent a, a message about uh, that we were actually downgrading the seriousness of, of trying to enforce. And um, there was a concern about a state statute uh, that prohibits the city from collecting or retaining uh, copies of agreements between landlords and tenants that contain the rent uh, length term. I think, I think it's the rent, the term of, of occupancy or other occupancy conditions. Uh, I know that there's still uh, some people out there in the community that have some concerns about that. Uh, my view and, and from both Marcus and I is that Either version we've presented doesn't act, doesn't on its face violate that ordinance because we have said that they must um, make available to us the contract. It doesn't say that we're going to collect or retain it. And it says that they only have to do that if there's reasonable cause, which in practice in our mind means probable cause, which means that if they don't actually provide it when we ask, we're going to go get a warrant. And, and the state statute that they're referencing says, um, even though it says we may not collect those, it says, except for as otherwise provided by state or federal law, which to us clearly means that if we have a warrant, we cl clearly could get it, right? Uh, and, and as I indicated, we're not intending to collect or retain it. We're just asking that they show us that it exists. And then to further mitigate that concern, if, you, if the council proceeds with version two, they have an option to provide us with something that doesn't even contain any of the con contractual terms that the state statute applies to. If all they give us is a document that says, I'm leasing the premises and I've, and I've uh, been given both of the disclosures, then the state statute shouldn't, the state statute they're worried about shouldn't apply to that. Um, I think, the, oh, the one, other, um, the one other issue that was addressed in the, ver the version submitted by, by those two was, um, the issue of, as it currently stands, it says every adult tenant has to sign the contract, right? And they had attempted to kind of ameliorate that because there is a concern, there's been a concern raised by some of, okay, if you've got, for instance, a married couple living in a rental, then that technically means both of them have to, have to sign it. Um, I, don't think that's, I don't think that's really an issue and the rental associate, the apartment association is even supportive of that's what they consider to be best practice. It would, however, as currently written, also mean that if they have a 19-year-old son or if they have a grandparent living with them, that they would also have to sign. Uh, and the two comments that I think I previously made on that is, is one, again, with this version two, um, it doesn't have to be a full-blown contract. Uh, two, even if we're going with, even if they are going with full-blown contract, there's no in the ordinance that says it has to be a separate contract. If you just had everybody's signature on it, it would be in compliance. And three, just reminding the council again that all of our all of our enforcement is complaint-based, and those particular situations are not going to be where we get a complaint. Uh, the likelihood of us going out and asking for a contract in that situation, I think, is extremely low. Yes, Mr. Winterton. Yes, as we talked about a Class B misdemeanor, jail time is potential. As is, as it is for a Class C. Well, and, it's a it's a potential in the sense that state statute authorizes it. It's not a potential in the sense that it's never happened in a zoning case, and I can't imagine that it ever will. And so, why do we do why do we do that then? If it's, <laughs> if it's never happened and it never will, why? Well, I guess two reasons. One, because it increases the limit of the fine. Okay. So, we can't increase the limit of an infraction. Correct. Okay. Correct. That helps me there. So the only way the only way that you increase the the upper limit of the fine is by increasing the seriousness of the offense. And two, because it does. Um, now again, the, 
I'm not saying that that's the only way to go. I'm just saying that these, these are the reasons, right? Uh, that it does send a message about how serious you, whether you consider it to be serious or not. It, it, it sends a message about the seriousness. Whether that really helps enforcement or not is, is I suppose, an open question. But um, I had another comment that I was going to make. Oh, and, and then I guess, even though I just said I can't imagine that ever happening, it does open the door if someone, I mean, I hesitate to even say this because we've had people refuse to come in compliance for two years and the judge still hasn't sent them to jail. So, but it, but it, but it theoretically could, I suppose, happen, although I'm very skeptical. Anyway. What are the differences in allowable fines between infraction class C and class B? Um, well, let's have Marcus so answer that. The fraction of class C is the same. The seven hundred and fifty dollars plus surcharge which brings it up to like a thousand fifty five. Whereas class B is a thousand, but the surcharge is higher, so it would be nineteen hundred and fifty dollars. Final surcharge. Okay, so I was mistaken. So the, so the only so the only difference between an infraction and a class B a class C is the potential jail time, which is up to ninety days. Um and the other difference is just kind of throwing it out there because we discussed these in our committee meeting is if it's an infraction, you are not um, eligible for a public defender because there's no jail time, and you're not eligible for a jury trial because there's no jail time. Now, having said that, in these kinds of cases, a lot of times you're not eligible for those things, even if it's charged as a Class C because the city would simply agree that there's no jail time as a, as a possibility in order for those same conditions to apply, if that makes sense. So the city, it's a city's option whether it would be a jury trial, then is what you're saying. It wouldn't be the option of the... Well, if, it, if, if it, so so here's what here's what happens, uh, <laughs> without revealing too much strategy. If, let's, let's, say, let's, say it's a, let's say it's a traffic offense that is serious enough that it's a Class C. We have on occasion, if someone demands a jury trial, turned around and reduced it to an infraction so that we didn't have to have a jury trial. Right, so the city can do that. If that right can affect. So they would have to reduce it, probably. You ha you'd have to reduce it to infraction in order to avoid a jury trial. That's correct. But okay. but you, you could, could simply stipulate that you would not be seeking any jail time, but just spend a jail time in order to avoid a public defense. Right. Right. That's so you could keep it as a class C misdemeanor, or if it's a second offense, a class B misdemeanor. Say so we're not seeking any jail time, we're suspended jail time, and then the judge they would not have to be entitled to a public defender under those circumstances. They'd still be entitled to a jury trial, but in the number of years that uh, I've been doing, or Pat, I've been doing this, and that my predecessors have been doing this, I think they've never, never had a case go to trial, and only once was it even close. And so I don't know that that's going to be a common issue because these cases uh, they tend to resolve. I will, I will say, because I feel like this is our, our duty to, to to inform the entire council of this. In our in our committee meeting. From the perspective of, of Marcus and Kerry and even myself, as far as the effectiveness of enforcement goes, as far as the actual prosecution of the crime, um, we don't have any strong opinion as to what the appropriate level of the offense should be. But the council members on the committee did have a strong opinion as to the, the public message that it sends uh, to reduce it to something else as, as a policy matter. So, yeah, we talked about <clears throat> reducing it because uh, I believe initially it was all class B. Correct. So, we talked about maybe keeping uh, the landlord class B and, and, and the tenant at C, or, or maybe even an infraction. And it was decided that it's better to keep them both at the same level. That was one of Mr. Thurston's other proposals, was to provide a different. Uh, a different offense category for landlords versus tenants. And while I haven't done any research to that I can definitively say that is absolutely not allowed, it causes me concerns from an equal protection standpoint because they are, would both be guilty of doing the exact same thing but would be subject to a different penalty for it. Right. So we decided to keep the penalty the same, and we also discussed that here we are in kind of business licensing and at the same time we're having this discussion and using this enforcement tool because of the over occupancy the zoning violation and zoning violations are all class, class C. C correct 
So it just seemed like, gee, if you're already at a Class C because of a zoning violation, this should be Class C, not Class B, not necessarily an infraction. So Class C it was. And it can be enhanceable, and that was, because I'm fine with Class B personally, but I, the fact that it's enhanceable for those that are sort of bad actors, the repeat offenders, that you, you, it is enhanceable. And so that's where I felt like it was a comfortable um, meeting in the middle just to have a Class C. Who actually levies the fine? Is it the judge? Yeah. The judge will determine the fine. This is a recommendation for that fine. Or well, in 99 yeah, percent of cases, that, yeah, um, go ahead, Marcus. For first-time offenders, typically this is resolved what's called a plan of advance, which uh, is an agreement between the city and the defendant that uh, allows the charge to be dismissed at the back end if they comply with the terms of the plan of advance agreement. Now, if they don't comply, then they can have their plea entered and be sentenced. And they be a conviction on their record. So with, with a plea in abeyance, then there's a specific agreement between the defendant and the city, and the judge doesn't have the authority to alter that, he can simply accept it or reject it. And so we, well, we're in, a, in the plea in advance circumstance, which is going to be the vast majority of the cases that get filed, um, the prosecutor, typically me, uh, will be the one determining the fee amount, it's not technically a fine. Um, but uh, so in that, if in a case where it would be an actual conviction for a straight appeal uh, to no contest and it'd be sentenced, the judge would determine in that situation and just have to make the recommendation. And and when he says when he says he's determining the fee, that actually means he's determining it in agreement with the defendant. Right. I would make in, exchange, an offer. in exchange for the plea in abeyance, because if they don't want if they reject the plea in abeyance and demand a jury trial or even a, a bench trial, then it's then it's the judge that's determining. Right, this would be in the case where it resolves and I make an offer between advance agreement and they accept that offer. But talking I, I in, would be the one making the offer and deciding yeah. what Ta the amount would be. Talking internally in the office, I don't think we've had a zoning trial in the last four plus um, years. Yeah, since uh, my predecessor, Mr. Millward, was doing it, he never had a trial. I have never had a trial in the last eight months. Ever ever been. Yeah. In, in <laughs> okay. these cases, just they, they resolve. Is um, it usually uh, by the time it gets to trial, you know, we're, we have uh, good evidence and they realize they're going to get convicted and those, they'd rather have the case dismissed than the plea of advance. So we, we talked about the message that we're sending the public. Um, the fines are the same for infraction in Class C. What I'm hearing from the public is the possibility of jail time for something like this, even though we never do it, seems very harsh. And from your perspective, if we were to start with an infraction and make it enhanceable to class C in the second offense, or class B on the third offense, do you see any disadvantages from an enforcement perspective? But, but since also in violation of class C, would you then Suggest all zoning violations on that same route, quite, quite distinguished from this and others. And I guess that would be, I, I guess, two two comments in answer to your question. You can think about your answer to Stuart's question. Well, so my first comment is that my, I guess the one logical, my one logical assault on that contention or question would be all other zoning violations are class C's and already carry that same potential penalty. So anybody who's in an over occupancy situation, we could, assuming we had the sufficient evidence, uh, already uh, charge them with a class C for the over occupancy. So in that way, I would say this is simply consistent with, with everything else that's already on the books. However, in direct, in direct answer to your question about from a legal perspective, do I think that that affects enforcement? The answer is no. And my answer to Mr. Stewart's question would be, I, I do see a difference between a typical zoning violation and something like this, because somebody, some of the landlords are saying, if if I can't um, get the tenant to, to sign, then this makes me a criminal, and, and I, I just think the nature of the offense and not being able to get someone to sign something is such that the lower starting lower makes sense to me. There's some avoiding says they have to be egregious. Right. So uh, with respect to that, and that was one of the questions that Mr. Sewell had had asked me previously by email. With regard to that specific contention, 
The language of the ordinance already for both landlords and tenants requires that the violation be knowing and knowing or intentional, meaning that they have to, in order to be guilty, in that particular situation, in order for them to be guilty, the landlord would actually have to know that the person was leaving living there and not try to get them to sign a contract. If, 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 they, know, if they don't know that they're living there, uh, even though they've taken reasonable steps to try to know, or, or if they know and they go try to get, get them to sign and they just refuse, then the tenant is going to be the one that we're going to enforce against, not the landlord. Um, it seems like and this may help landlords in the turnaround times that they would want to evict people that shouldn't be there. Uh, right. I mean, they could come to us and ask for, uh, I mean, ask for help because we could, they could file their own over occupancy complaint. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that would kind of, um, it was Neil uh, that came in and the big older gentleman, and he's like, "Well, you know, I, I'm not even sure who's living in there. And they won't let me in. And there's a problem. I don't have a contract. There's too many people. So it, it could actually give the, the landlord some leverage because these people are supposed to have a contract with him, right? And and then there's only supposed to be so many of them. I, I know we're already in. We've got the." Laws already on the book. We're not changing any laws, as far as the occupancy goes. And so, are are we? Is there any need for to consider a action at, when this would go into effect? How do we deal with? Oh that? yeah, I did, sorry, I, I left that out because it's not actually in the exhibit. Um, <coughs> what I, between last meeting and this meeting, I altered the form of the ordinance itself, itself which used to. It had the whole preamble, and then it had the text of the ordinance. And I amended it I, so that now the text of the code is on an exhibit. If you look at the ordinance itself, uh, by recommendation of the Zoning Committee, it has an effective date of January 1st, 2018. And so that means it wouldn't go into effect before the end of the semester, uh, to the extent that that uh, applies to people. And it would give uh, landlords and tenants uh, you know, two or three months from the time of passage to, to come into to uh, compliance and and then again one of the things that we've talked about internally is that even after it goes into effect um, our enforcement mechanism is to wait for a complaint and then to go investigate the complaint and at, and and uh, ask people to come into compliance then issue a notice of violation then send a legal letter so even after January 1st you're in essence only going to have a problem with this if there's a complaint against you for, for over occupancy that's being investigated and you refuse to come into compliance in 45 to 60 days. Mr. Now this is this is in the license bill, uh, business license code. Correct. So if someone say in February they their license is good through the middle of the year, um, would they be required to show like you know, we, we come and say, you know, there's been an over occupancy complaint, can you show us your contracts? And they say, I don't have them, my business license isn't up until mid-year. I mean, would they still need to come into compliance by January to, the, the, to follow the law? The way it's currently drafted, uh, by just putting a flat implementation date of January 1st, once January 1st comes around, if we go ask for the contracts, they would have to show them whether their business license is up for renewal or not. Okay. Um, and we, when we discussed that with the Apartment Owners Association yesterday, uh, and they didn't have any concerns with that, um, uh, because we also discussed with them this issue of that you're, we're still only going to ask if there's a complaint, and even if we have a complaint, you're going to have uh, opportunities to come into compliance before we would ever file charges. So, just building off of that, if you ran into someone and said, hey, so complaint, we get to see the contracts, and they go, oh, yeah, well, we really haven't gotten around to that yet. So would we then say, well, can you get around to that in, like, the next few days and supply us with documents? I mean, if they don't actually have them but are willing to get them in a reasonable time and say, okay, here's all the signed contracts for the three legal people, then we're not going to say, gee, you didn't have them when we asked. Right. Right, that's exactly what I think Marcus has come Yeah, up. so um, again, with uh, the way we currently do enforcement, uh, the zoning officers are going to work with the person before they even issue like, this notice of violation. 
So if the person is, yeah, I get that to you in, to, in you know, a week or two weeks, they're going to be okay. Get that to me, you know, in that time frame. That sounds like a reasonable time frame. And, you know, if that doesn't work, they can issue a notice of violation. That gives them two weeks to comply. If that doesn't work, they'll refer the case to me. When I screen the case, I will send them a letter demanding compliance for 30 days as far as we can file. So we're looking at they have several months to come to compliance. So if in the event that there's a complaint, we see and then I discover that there are no written contracts that comply with the ordinance. So it's a situation where they would have an ample opportunity to rectify any issue in a specific situation. Um, and again, you know, we've, we've probably said this more times than it bears repeating, but with with all zoning and co compliance enforcement, the city's intent is to achieve compliance, not to prosecute people. Yes, Mr. Hardy. Um, in, in reading the different drafts where we've gone now, I believe, to it's where the mm -hmm. tenants, acknowledgement by the landlord and the tenant of the tenants Lease, lease of the premises. premises. Uh, it got me thinking. Um, you know, these definitions are not full inclusive. Like you know, one uh, B just says tenant includes any uh, leasee and subleasee. I'm curious if, if we're opening up a loophole where uh, someone subleases on behalf of someone else to occupy. You know, a, a parent leases for their two children or some, something like that. Is, is, does that open open it up where you have a subleasee? It does not intend to occupy, but to allow others to occupy. Well, uh, I think that only opens up a loophole if the parent is subletting on behalf of a minor. Because if the, if the child of the parent who is actually going to live there is an adult, they would be in violation if they have not also signed the document. Because they are an adult tenant. And that's what I was getting at. I agree with that interpretation. In the situation where they're a minor, then somebody would have to sign on their behalf. Right. I, don't, I, I can't really envision that situation actually taking place. Mr. Because McGinn. the minor is going to have to live with an adult, typically, unless they're emancipated. Well, one of the things we need to remember is this is a tool to get to the real issue, which is over occupancy. If there's not an over occupancy, or we really believe that there's really good evidence of an elder occupancy, we're never going to ask for this stuff because it's going to waste our time and everybody's time. This is, you know, if this ordinance gets passed, we're not now knocking on everybody's door saying, ah, show us your contract, because we don't care unless we need this as a tool to help us resolve an elder occupancy. Mr. Parker, do you have anything to add from your perspective or the mayor's perspective? To this I, I think you've I think you've covered it really well. So I, I think a lot of the questions we had have been subsequently answered by the revisions. So um, again, I think I'll just reiterate what I said in council meeting two weeks ago, which was um, the more tools you give us to enforce the ordinance, the easier it is for us to enforce. And again, no tool gets used in the same way in two different circumstances. Um, and it's just going to be very case fact specific in how we utilize this tool along with all the other tools that have been provided for us. All right. Yep. One more quick. They, as I met with some of the young single professionals, they're saying, well, you're telling us all these facts about schools and all these things um, as far as how many are really over occupied. We don't. And I don't know if we really know because we, we're not getting that many. I don't, apparently, we're not getting that many complaints that we're enforcing. On our, is that right? How many? What's the situation that we're dealing with? Is that something that I don't understand? And they say, well, why don't you get the information? Why don't you find out how many really are over occupied? And it's really impossible to do. Nobody's willing to admit to it. But I get it. That um, is it. Is this affecting the schools? Is this affecting? I am. What, what's the problem we're trying to solve here, I guess? Over-occupancy, and what does that mean? We got... Well, well the, the, from an enforcement standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the council has passed an ordinance that says 
in most circumstances, uh, a, a dwelling unit is, can only be inhabited by a family, traditional family, mom, dad, kids, people related together, or three unrelated people. And that's the vast majority. We have some batching areas in the city. But the vast majority of situations, that's it. And, it's, and if there's four in, in a unit, unrelated people, that's a violation of our occupancy code. And so we'll go in and we'll enforce that. Right. But it's not the occupancy, it's the effect of the occupancy. And that's the questions that they would like to have answered. Uh, is the parking a real problem? Is it really a problem? It depends on the area that you're talking about. And, and some people would say merely having four in a unit in some circumstances is a problem, even though there's not a parking problem. Because if you have four in a unit, uh, say it's a single family, deta a detached single family home on its own individual lot, and it's turned into this rental, and you have four, five, six uh, unrelated people living in it, the economics of that home is now priced out of the reach of a, a uh, uh, average median income family, mom, dad, kids. And we, we have an affordable housing uh, crisis in, in Utah County, which is only going to get worse. And so some people would say an over-occupancy of four or five in that situation, even though there's ample parking, ample bedrooms, things like that, skews the economics such that as a policy directive, the council wants to take care of it. Now you may go into some other places that it's all singles uh, uh, living in, in these units, and you may have four in one of those. And, and but because of that over occupancy, now you have cars out on the street. So maybe it is those externalities that, that creates the problem. And, and that's what I think that a lot of the young single professionals is, why are we being, why is this? What's the problem we're creating? They think everything life is good. Well, that's and why so there's not one solution and one answer for every situation in the city. Uh, in an area that's full of condos or apartments that singles tend to live in, has different solutions and answers to it than a R110 neighborhood, a single family home. And that's what they would like to see is this break those rules down, expand the occupancy in some areas and decrease it in other areas, um, depending on the effect, and rather than have this deal with all of the whole city, and, and that's a whole different discussion, right? But, but, but this is just a tool to help us get to the, that issue. Now, if there's an issue to talk about what is the appropriate occupancy in different areas of the city, then I say let's have that discussion. And have that, but that's not what this discussion's about. This discussion's about regardless of whether we say it's three, four, five, six in an area, this could help us ha uh, in those, is a tool that could help us if there's, if the occupancy is six and now there's an over occupancy of seven, this could be a tool to help us there. Makes sense. Mr. Pinnick. And uh, <clears throat> Jim, weren't you saying that uh, over in Arlington, what were they now advertising? Yeah, they, it used to be that they would kind of hide the fact that they had six people in about four or five of the units. And now I just noticed, um, I don't know, a month or so ago, with their advertising, don't even bother applying unless you have six to eight people to apply for one unit. So it's gone from, you know, before it was supposed to be three in each unit. They were sneaking six in, but now they're boldly advertising on Craigslist, don't even bother applying unless you have six to eight people. It's the same story in different neighborhood. And I don't think, I'm just reading an email from Hannah Peterson who said that, um, her neighborhood, the Provost neighborhood. So they located owner names from county records, recorded the homes which were rentals and which were not, also identified most of the homes that were illegally occupied and used a spreadsheet um, that they shared with the zoning office to report these cases. During this time, they also made an attempt to contact landlords and realtors that were advertising illegal properties. Um, and she, you know, what makes someone go to those great lengths in a neighborhood? If everything's fine, if it's, they're not bothering anybody, if there are no complaints, why would anyone in their right mind go to these great lengths to track every single house in a neighborhood 
because the problem has gotten so bad that they feel like this is their only and resource. That's what I want to do is talk about the problem. And that and the problem starts with over occupancy and then all the other things are symptoms. So and they keep trying to say just fix the parking. Well you can't fix the parking. There's not a parking permit program that will fix this problem because it just keeps growing. And we've watched it grow from Foothill to the down by seven peaks that, that group that just came to us. We've watched it go all the way to Provost. It just balloons. You, you put a parking pump permit program here, and it just pushes it into the next neighborhood. That's why Wasatch didn't want to do it when they actually got into the details of it. They didn't want a parking permit program because they knew it would just push it into the next neighborhood. And you had that half of the neighborhood saying, no way, no how. So it, you can't fix this problem by addressing just the parking. You've got to fix what the, the core of the problem, which is over-occupancy. If you take the over-occupancy down, then you don't have an extra third or fourth or fifth car displaced on the street. And, it, and I think it solves the parking pr problem. And so anyway, I just don't think anyone in their right mind would go to these measures to try to address something if it wasn't a, a major, major problem in their neighborhood. Um, so there, I, I don't know if you had the time, but do take the time to go on to, let's see, I think I sent it out to the email too, uh, just today. But I, I posted a history of uh, planning and zoning in Southeast Provo. Right. And I tried to quote every relevant document, including the general plan, which uh, talks about uh, why neighborhoods in the past uh, uh, voted to reduce uh, family occupancy and, and the goals and reasons for doing that, uh, which did talk about in the general plan that it was affecting the price of the housing and, and that starts first with the price of the rent where in the Pioneer Drive has been talking about the Pioneer HOA they earlier this year advertised on MLS that there was a home with six contracts which was they're, they're not legal but they said they were and that the home was bringing in twenty three hundred dollars a month well that price is way out of ballpark for a family. And there still are some families that live in that uh, HOA, not here, there's five or six. But the more properties that can boldly just say, well, this is how much money you can get. And then it's no longer affordable for a family to rent. And after a while, that high rental income affects the resale price of the property because it's now an income property. I'm not arguing with I agree with that. And I just got a text from Shannon, and this makes sense to me. She says, why not add language that explains the intent of this ordinance like Gary Indian just stated? And the reason, and I think that that's good, I think a lot of the time people are not understanding what the intent of this legislation is. Some people are thinking the intent is to get rid of single people. And that, I don't believe that's our intent. They don't really think it's our intent. Well, let's let's tell us what the intent is. Let's just ex expressly explain. This is the intent. So along that line, <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to commend the zoning committee for and, and the administration for coming up with uh, what seems to me to be a very innovative tool. Um, I'm aware of other cities in the area that have tried this. Um, it does seem like it has the potential to to be very effective. However, I personally don't feel like we're ready to vote yet. I still have more questions for our time. Um, I would like to send what we've got now to Representative Thurston and have him respond back. How do you feel about this version now that we've made these changes? I'd like to send it to the two rep state representatives that represent me and see how they feel about it. Um, because it is different and because it is unique, it, it kind of puts us out there a little bit where we might be susceptible to a challenge uh, legally or someone wanting to bring it to the legislature. I just think before we pass it, let's take just a little more time. I don't see any reason to rush this. I'd even like to send a copy to uh, the ULCT, the David Church and Meg Ryan, to say, how do you feel about this? See any red flags? Any any feedback for us? Uh, another thing is I'm concerned about public perception. I know we'll never bring everyone on board, uh, but I do think we can message this and explain this far better than we have. 
and there is a lot of misunderstanding out there about the intent, about the, the likely effect. I think uh, personally, all we need is maybe six more weeks. So I would propose scheduling a vote for November 14th, which would be two council meetings from now. Um, I think we need to involve more young single professionals in this discussion. This will be a powerful tool, but if we can get more of them, and I believe many of them genuinely want to be law abiding citizens, they want to help, they want to be part of the solution, not considered part of the problem. To whatever extent we can bring more of them in on this and kind of lockstep with this, I think that will magnify the power of this tool several fold. So that's uh, Mr. Stewart. Counterpoint? Yes. I have not had the legislature send me their bills to review. I'm elected to make decisions based on the information that I've been given. If they don't have, will not have, there'll be a biased view because they don't they haven't had the months of time and effort to review this. And so I just I can't even believe that we haven't given enough time and effort to involve as many people as we could reasonably. You know, and I agree with that. My biggest concern is the people that are coming that are going to be affected. And um, I don't know that we have. My, my biggest frustration with the people that are going to be affected is that I have yet to hear any real solutions from a lot of those other people at this point. Let's give us the solutions. I'd like to give them the opportunity to give us a solution. I like the way we kind of did it with. As you mentioned, David, the Soil Committee, we have this legislation ready to go, and unless you've got something better, you better, you know, work. This is what I think we're going to do. It's interesting. Um, I, I, I'd like to, I don't know if six weeks is long, too long or if it's too short. Maybe if we gave them two weeks to our next meeting, Dave, just to give them the opportunity to say, please, this is better, I'll give it to you. And then we can determine that. My only concern about the two weeks, by the way, Mr. Winterton, is I, I feel like today was very rushed. This very morning before the vote, I'm just now understanding some of the key points. Right. And, two, and, I get and I'm, my fear is if we, if we only allow two weeks, there could be a few more changes. We may have another meeting the day before, like we had yesterday, where the changes are introduced and end up the day before the vote still changing. So well, if we're changing, are we not making it better? Well, yeah, I mean, that's why I think that I think the six weeks would give us plenty of time to make sure all that gets done. We've got a stable proposal on the table. Yeah. Um, question, yes. Mr. Chair. The only thing that changed was what was not substantive. The only thing that changed since Thursday uh, was the, and this was a, just a result of Jeremiah Mon in our meeting yesterday asking for clarification of the phrase. So we just changed the phrase, tenants intend to occupy the premises to tenants lease of the premises, just because we felt like after discussing that with him that, that phrase made more sense. Well, uh, for example, the version two was not widely known by the public. I, from, from what you said, apparently it was up for a short time on Sire and it somehow got taken down. And when I looked for it last night, it wasn't there got put back up this morning. So a lot of the public is has not seen or understood this this latest version of it. So but it doesn't change the outcome because all the things that are in there were were available to us before. Right? I mean it changes the class B misdemeanor to class C with the that's enhanceable, but it still doesn't change in action what the administration can do. They could still right? I mean I don't know that it changes Right. I, I mean, I don't think Anything. that uh, I'd be hard pressed to come up with something that changed that I thought was not something that uh, previous comments had asked for to improve it, um, that, and that those who asked for them would view as 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 detrimental. Uh, having said that, uh, this is a completely separate issue of when to vote on it, but I would appreciate. Uh, from this meeting, in addition to knowing when it's going to go forward, uh, some guidance on, on choosing between version one and two. Just, I think that would be helpful to staff. So, well, version one and two, as in the definitions, 
Yeah, right, right. The version that has the definition section at the beginning yeah. versus the version. Yeah, very helpful. I would move that we approve that version. Okay. Along with the definition, so your most recent version. Okay. Which is two. Right, two. right. Yeah. right. Yeah. I move that we approve that version. I'll second that with respect to comparing it to version two, although I think further changes are needed. Right, right. That, yeah, no, the intent of that is just to ask, as we as we move forward, which one are we working from as the base? Right. Any discussion on one version one versus version two as a starting point for some nice discussion? There's no further discussion. All in favor? Yes, I'm just curious to know. Okay. There was one thing that I, I apologize. I should have asked earlier. It slipped my mind for just a moment. Um, I do remember Mr. Mon talking about how there's times where um, or he was concerned about having the approval letter as part of that. Yeah, we discussed that at significant length yesterday, and I just didn't bring it up because at the end of the day, we all agreed not to make any changes. Um, he did have some concern about uh, personal information of the owners in the letter, but we indicated to him that there's nothing in the ordinance that prevents redaction of those letters. So the solution is simply that if they get a letter, they can, the only place that it contains any personal information is, is where the address appears at the top. So they would just wipe that out before they gave it to, to the tenants. And he had also indicated that it made more sense to him to have, uh, instead of having to provide that letter, to provide a statement. But we talked at some time, for some time about that yesterday, and, and the Apartments Association was actually strongly in favor of, of requiring the actual letter because they felt like allowing the landlord to provide their own statement created actual liability for the landlord if the landlord then misstated things. And and, and Mr. Maude at the end of the discussion was okay with that. So. Let me just clarify one thing. I would really like to support this and vote for this. I think it's a, a very, uh, it's a very effective tool. Um, if, if there are going to be legal challenges, I, I would rather hear about it beforehand as much as we can. That's why I want to make sure we check, cover all our bases there. So that's one reason I can get extra time. But if, uh, and, and I really do think we can get a stronger public support for this than we have right now. Um, so uh, if, if the majority is public, Support is not important, or if my support is not important, then I'd say go ahead, but I can't support it tonight. You need a motion so we can vote? Uh, really to entertain you. Well, actually, do we? Because it's already on the agenda, so we're going to be voting on it anyway. Yeah. We could leave the issue unresolved uh, on whether we're going to vote on it tonight. I, but if, I, I guess the question was is there a, a majority that wants to set a date or not? Or do you want so let me just uh, so procedural. Let me just say um, by our standard rules, there's our, there is tonight an implied motion on the table, and based on the motion that just passed, that implied motion would be to approve uh, exhibit version two, right? So if there's no motion made now, that's what will happen, uh, barring somebody making a motion in tonight's meeting, right? But if there was a, if there was a feeling or that it shouldn't be voted on tonight. A motion to that effect could be made now, and um, I, I will say that if that is the case, or if that is already the majority opinion, I think it might be helpful for both the council and the public to know that going into the discussion tonight. But otherwise, there's no motion necessary. Mr. Hardy, I'd like to move that we postpone the voting on this item until the 14th of October, November. Um, I do think there's uh, you know, I, I support this motion as, or sorry, the, the, the ordinance as it's written. I think it's, I think it's a good thing. I do think that there is some value, kind of like we did um, with the solar. I think there's value in in engaging more with the community, getting more buy-in. Um, as as Mr. McGinn kind of explained earlier about, you know, the real value is just having people follow the law rather than trying to, to fight them on it. And I, and I think bringing the, the, the public along, helping them understand, I don't remember who made the comment anymore, so much talking, but um, about, you know, what is the intent? If we, can, if we can do better to help the public understand what the intent of this is, 
um, I think we'll we'll get a better result at, at the end. So I, I, I would make that motion. So the motion is to uh, and we schedule the vote for this on the Is there a second? I'll second that, and I just have a question about that. Will we change the effective date? Because I don't see any need to change the effective date. That could be a separate question. I'd support keeping the effective date the same. So in my mind, if we're keeping the effective date the same, somebody wants to talk about it for another few weeks, let them talk. Um, so tonight would be the fourth public hearing on this item. Second. Fourth. Well, we had it on the house, which is different. That's public. That's a public um, hearing. And then we had a, a council-sponsored hearing. I mean, maybe it's not classified as a public hearing, but it was open to the public, and we listened to public input. So I, don't know. I think semantics. There's been four opportunities for people to speak to it. Only two of them have been in, in notice formal, meetings of the whole council. Right, right. So there have been four opportunities. Um, after tonight, there will have been four opportunities to to um, comment. And as Mr. Winterson said, you know, we're not necessarily here. At least I'm not hearing anything that that moves the needle on whether this is going to be helpful or not for the administration. Nothing to date has has shown me or told me personally that it, it's going to move the needle or it's going to change our decision or say, oh, no, we don't like this ordinance. And we don't like, we don't want to give this to the administration. We want to give them this tool because, because you know, of this. Um, and I just, to delay it just to, a, you know, a date in November, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, and I kind of, I agree with Mr. Stewart. Um, Mr. Thurston lives in our, you know, in our area, he's, he's impacted by those. I think it was good to get input from him, it's good to get input from all those interested, but I don't know that we need to take it to the state legislature to make sure they're, they have buy-in before we move forward on something. I mean, this is in our purview, this is our responsibility to make a decision on, on these issues, and our citizens expect us to make a decision on these issues, and we talk about public, not enough public input. Since I've been on the council, this is number one input from, from people. Number one, every year, this has been a concern. Um, so I personally have had almost four years of input on this, and we're just now coming to one of the basic tools that we can offer the administration. So I, I'm hoping we can move forward on this tonight. I'm really hoping we'll move forward on it tonight because I think there's been a lot of public discussion. I think there's, I mean, and like I said, years of public discussion if we're considering all public and not just one demographic. Who are you looking at? Okay. We're going to have a vote here in a second. I don't know if you have any wisdom for us. For me, it's all just, it was just a misperception. And I, I apologize to the members of the committee, but you, you are very, very strong, and I respect your opinions on this. And I think the perception is that this is not something that has had adequate voice at this point because of you three. And I respect you. Please know I'm going to vote for this as it is right now. I agree with it. But the perception is different. And I wonder if just we're not changing the information date, implementation date. This is all, to me, it's all about perception and trying to work with people. Please know I respect what you're, what you're doing and, and your opinion, and I agree with what you've done. Thank you. And I very much appreciate it, too. I expect to be voting for it as well, although I do have at least one change I'm going to propose when we do at some, some point along the way. But, um, it, you know, if uh, there's some things that are just expedient to vote on and again, push them through on a fourth re-vote, uh, so be it. I personally don't think this should be one of them. I think this is an important uh, 
issue for the community. I think it, the, the more public support, the more council support we can get for it, the better. Enforcement is not just about tools, it's about cooperation from our citizens in respect to the law. And a lot of people have not seen or understood some of the things we've talked about this very afternoon, and I think we need to get that message out there. We have, people have the time to soak it in before we vote. That's pretty much all I've got, Mr. Kinect. Well, I think we have heard from both sides. We heard two years ago from the young single adults who came to the Southeast area of Planning Committee voice these same concerns. We had a long discussion. They made a proposal which didn't really get past community development, didn't really solve the problem. Uh, they're in the process of trying to come up with another proposal, which is really separate from this tool. Uh, we had discussions about the definition for ever since 2003, and we're still talking about that definition. Why do we have it? it? Should be eliminated, and it could be we'll always have this discussion. Uh, this particular ordinance was, as Gary pointed out, 21 day uh, on the table in 2003 when we were considering rental dwelling licensing, which was a big deal. <coughs> it was taken off the table because it was feared that rental dwelling licensing wouldn't pass, and that, that passed for three. So this tool is not a new tool. It's, it's been on a, a, talked about for many years, and it seems to be industry standard best practice. But I am sensitive to another 4 3 vote. Um, I don't really want to go down that road. I would, as much as I don't think we need the time on the one hand, because I think we have the information, there is something to be said for the reception of the process and our willingness to be patient. Listen. So, yeah, I, I'm very conflicted on this, but I, I would, uh, if it was five to two, I'd feel a lot better than that. But I, I, four to three is not where I really want to go. And that's kind of why I was asking <laughs> where we were. <laughs> I'm not going to support this motion to do that. Any further discussion? I'm going to call for a vote the motion all in favor. Please state the motion we do to the schedule vote for November 14th on this issue. More discussion. Um, I'm just thinking the words you put it. Um, two, two weeks. What's the a, a substitute motion for two weeks? So just like that. October 17th. Mm -hmm. So you're making a, you I, I substitute motion to, for October 17th. We both kind of voted on the 17th. Okay. I'm well second that. On that day, so that's going to be what you're doing. Can you call me in that meeting? I, 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 I prefer the 14th over the 17th, November 14th over the October 17th, but I'd also prefer the 17th over today. 
Um, so I guess I can support that with with the uh, understanding. I mean, I, I, would, I would make a firm commitment that on the on November seventeenth, October, on on November seventh, November fourteenth, I can make a firm commitment on November fourteenth. You know, uh, unless something really drastic happens, I'd be ready to vote for it. Um, on the on October seventeenth, you know, I may still not feel like I'd be ready at that time. But again, I I guess uh, if there's not enough. You know, I, I, again, I prefer October 17th to voting on it. I'll, I'll just throw this out here for a completely self, selfish motivation, which is that I leave on Thursday Thursday afternoon for the APPA legal seminar and won't be back until the following Wednesday. So as far as the logistics of October 17th, any changes that I'm going to be responsible for making are going to be happening in on October 12th. I'm going to lose a dollar session. And, and, I, and I think, as I, as I think about losing with dollars, because I'm not, we're not taking the implementation date in my mind. And so I'm, I'm fine with the 14th. Um, mm -hmm. November. All right, is there any further discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor? to go home uh, like because I am really, you know, I am determined. I agree with Dave on the 14th. I want to pass something. Yeah. And I want it to go into effect January 1. I think we should continue with public comment for everything that we have to say. Let them know that we're not, just like the person that we're not planning to vote on it. Why? Would you please do that? Yes, absolutely. All right, we're we're way behind, so let's. Uh, oh boy. <laughs> um, what, how much have we got for closed session today? There's a, a fair amount to discuss, including the presentation. The only thing that I would, say, what I would recommend, uh, Mr. Chair, is is that um, defer the closed meeting until after the regular meeting. Defer or postpone the, the the closed meeting till after the regular regular meeting, but bring in Chief Ferguson to introduce to the council prior to the regular meeting, and then um, the food has arrived, and we could either have people go down and grab something, or we could try and re reposition it at the back so we can eat well and still make our five thirty regular council meeting. Okay. Um, I'm just curious, looking at the three items we still have left, is it even a possibility that we ask to have basically the presentation that we would have here, have it in tonight's meeting? Well, the yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I item think they four, five, five, six, and seven. Well, seven's not in the committee. Oh, so maybe continue number seven. And then have so just have a longer presentation tonight for, for the that's, two that's what I'm that's what I'm floating. That's the idea I'm floating. Is there any objections to that for six and seven? Uh, since they're already on the schedule. Five, five and six, you mean. Five and six. And then as far as number seven, what's the I can do it sooner than later take one minute or tonight. Okay, let's dive right into number seven. Okay, so item seven is um, in the 2008 budget of which we're currently in, uh, the municipal council as a part of the budget process approved a $100,000 appropriation out of fund balance to be used for a revolving loan fund. As we've been working with the our, count, or our legal counsel and the council from, legal counsel from other communities, it was determined that we cannot use the money as a 
loan loss guarantee, and that's what the premise of coming to the council was originally. What we're being told now is that if we're going to do it, we have to actually participate directly with the loan fund itself. So we'd be making a portion of the loan directly to the loan recipients. Uh, the criteria are still the same for which we would base a loan. Um, if the loan goes south, whether it was a loan guarantee or a direct loan, we're still out the money. Um, so all we're doing, we didn't feel right going forward with this change in premise without coming back to the council and asking and or at least informing you this is our intent to continue to move forward. The money is still there. We're not changing the fund. We're not changing the premise as far as it's still for a small business that would otherwise not qualify for a conventional loan through commercial lending. These are some of the criteria that none of the criteria have changed. It's just really rather than being a loan guarantee for the loss leader, which is the first money lost if the loan does go bad, it's actually a part of the loan. By doing a loan, we actually get some interest back as they pay the loan back. It's a loan guarantee, we don't get anything back. It's just money that's put into an escrow account. When the loan's paid off, it comes back, but there's no interest. This, we at least have some interest coming back, and all we're doing is just informing the council of why we're doing it. From your perspective, difference in risk assessment? It's the same. We're already doing this? <laughs> no, we, we have not started yet because the loans have not been able to go forward because we haven't had a legal mechanism to do it based on doing a direct loan or a loan loss guarantee. Is this for C-PACE then? I don't remember. No, it's not C-PACE. No, we've talked to the council twice in this uh, in this setting That's on uh, the revolving loan front. Oh, okay. Yes, the revolving, I'm sorry, as a part of the revolving loan fund, yes. Okay. This is something that we... Um, I don't know, I guess I was confused. I don't know why we're carrying loans for for businesses. I think that's something that we've done in the revolving loan fund. We have in the past under the block grant funding. This is actual fund balance from the economic development fund. And it was a part of an appropriation that was part of the budget that was approved that you adopted and approved on July or June 20, whatever that was. It was a part of the budget. But so the money's a, already appropriated. Presentation from Tom Christopoulos, who's the economic development director in Ogden about the statewide consortium that they're doing with Zions Bank to put together this loan concept. And there are a number of cities uh, involved and counties in the process. And they came and made a lengthy presentation to the council uh, last spring, maybe, uh, February, March time for anyone. And so we went ahead and built it in the budget and then based on your positive feedback. And then now we're just saying they're changing the premise of the, of the concept. Uh, so, so that's, that's what, we're, that's what we're coming to disclose. And this is not on the agenda tonight for action. It's, it, this is just the, that part of it, the, the work session. Why is this given what we were doing with the business of the other corporation? Why did this get into that? Because the, 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 the staff person went away because we weren't doing enough fund loans from the block grant funding. We couldn't fund an actual personnel. We could fund the loans themselves. So the block grant money was reappropriated back to the redevelopment agency. So what they're doing is similar to what BDC was doing? Yes, it's correct. Very similar. Yeah, in, in this case, we're matching the loan. We're paying one-seventh, right? One-seventh. So for amount, every so. 100000 that we make available, Zions makes another six to 700000 available for our community only. So this is leveraging uh, private sector money to make it to work for a smaller business that's not had a track record yet of uh, you know, to make it get a conventional loan. Would Zions approve loans because the one seventh is coming from us and they wouldn't approve otherwise? Why, why, why would they just approve the loan themselves and they're going to go 6-7? Yes. It, it, because it's part of a, a funding package um, from uh, Neighborhood Housing Services, which is a statewide organization, and this is part of Zion's way of getting community reinvestment funds, of which they have to call. Oh yes, yeah. This is it's not completely philanthropic, but it is a move in the right direction from Zion's on our local businesses' behalf. They would make loans to get credit that they might not make otherwise. Yep. Yep. Would you do we redo this each year with the new budget, or is this going to be only if we need more money? If we need more money. The intent is for the hundred thousand dollars to be seed money. Again, because the money it ideally will be paid back plus interest, goes back into the fund with the uh, with the consortium and is available to into another couple of business. So you're comfortable with the 
the risk and <clears throat> you will be closely uh, involved the, in any of it. Yeah, them. we don't make the loan unless our office makes a recommendation on it first, of which this is the criteria that we're using, and we can go through that if you choose. Criteria doesn't change, it's just how our money is being used, whether it's a direct loan or a loan loss guarantee. Thank you for the clarification. That was not in our documents I read through all of it. It was mostly oh, like how to. It was not really necessarily what like, it's happening today. So. so except for that one change, this is all things I'm giving a thumbs up on. That's cool. that's correct. All right, and you'll be bringing this back in to us in two weeks. Yes, yes. schedule. Yes. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. All right, uh, I guess we need a motion. Did I miss something? Um, we need a motion to uh, go into closed session. Okay, since I understand it, we have two items, uh, one regarding um, capacity and competence of an individual, and the other uh, regarding the sale of city property. Both would be appropriate for this session. Looking for a motion to go into closed session. So, moved by Mr. Aguirre, second by Mr. Knapp. Any discussion? All in favor? Thank you.